Hello and welcome to a Taylor's Tales podcast. This is Chris's Corner. I'm your host, Chris Taylor. And today we're back with a man who deals with myths for a living and loves the underverse and life of understanding the unknown. Welcome back, Ollie Deacon. How's it going, all right? Yeah, man. It's good. We're yeah, ready to go for, 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 oh, mate, you deserve it. You always do. These, these podcasts are gripping, to say the least. Um, and we're, we're tackling one point, the uh, part one of The Lord of the Rings, The Return to the King, the 11-time Academy Award women, winning Return of the King. I like that. Uh, only defeated by Ben Eyre and uh, the Titanic, from what I remember, when it comes down to Academy okay. Awards. Uh, when it comes down to it. But we're jumping right in. And Ollie, I, I'm going to go to you for this one because I think you will get this straight away. The first scene is obviously the two hobbits on the river and just, just fishing in their lovely little boat, yeah. Smeagol and Deagle. And the first thing we see within that scene is that the uh, Deagle falls into the water and basically dives into the to the un, un, unconscious of uh, of mm. the mind and the rings there. And I wanted to see what you thought of that because that's you know it's a quite uh, we're straight into the movie and that's one of the first things we see. What's what were your thoughts when you when you see that? I mean, of course, the ring is going to be underwater because um, it's sort of been it's been lost and forgotten for you know however many thousand years or so. Is is it like because Gollum had it for, for five hundred years? Um, mm, yes. And the Battle of the Last Alliance was, was it 3,000 years before? Because that yes. was the start of yeah. the Third Age, wasn't it? So it's been like underwater for, I, we don't know how, I don't know how long Isildur had it for, but let's say it's been underwater for 2,400 years. You know, it's a long, long, long time. Um, and then these sort of sweet little innocent creatures that have absolutely no idea about the horrors of the world. Um, they discover this, you know, this means of domination over their fellow man, so to speak, and, and it's only like shallow. It's only like shallowly underwater. It's like it's not like they haven't got to go right to the depths of, of hell to find it. It's like it, it's right there, um, literally within, you know, within the reach of, of the eagle. And, yeah. He it's takes scene, it. Man. Powerful scene. It Isn't is. It? Yeah, I, I like that you put it that way because time seems to mend all wounds and in this case we're looking at it in the same way because like you say it's shallow isn't it it's 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 not they don't have to go deep to be able to get the ring it's just in the gra- it's almost just a grab away a reach away and how is is sealed or dies does resemble that in the sense that he just falls into the river and the ring betrays him and so it does make sense that it is somewhere almost convenient you know yeah. that's how the ring likes to be found in in some way or another, mm. um, and I love that we, we jump in and within seconds the ring has an impact on the two characters we see. And yeah. did did you see that? Did you what, what did you think oh, yeah. when you? Yeah, definitely. So well, so I I recently listened to the um, the the audio book. Yes. Um, I fa- found a, an an edition that has the music from the films, so it's just absolutely brilliant. But Gandalf tells the story of the finding of the ring um, of Gollum or of Smeagol um, when he's in the Shire with Frodo and it's before. And it's basically, to summarise it, Smeagol was always interested in uh, the history of things and like he was always interested in looking down and like discovering things. Um, and it, it kind of suggested to me that he was aware of the existence of his shadow or of a shadow of some sort. Um, but he just never knew like the danger of it. And then when he finds the ring, it's like straight away he is uh, completely overwhelmed by its power. Yeah. Um, and it is a it's a, it's a striking scene because they're like they're supposed to be I think they're cousins um, in the. They are in the indeed. Um, yep. And so like Gollum is like well Smeagol, completely overwhelmed, um, and he kills <laughs> kills his cousin. Like, you know, it's that 20 seconds from, from the discovery of the ring, from, from Deagle having the ring, to Smeagol having the ring, it's like yeah. 20 seconds. Um, and it's a, it's a really, I, I listened to it with, I, I watched the film, sorry, with uh, headphones recently on my, my projector that I've got here. Um, 
and it's the music and the atmosphere it's so intense um and when Smeagol is strangling Deagle, as the life leaves Deagle, the music changes and it's yeah. like he suddenly wakes up and it's like whoa did, did you notice <laughs> what music it was playing that that's the question probably not Go on. <laughs> it is the same music used to describe the Nazgul so the same scream in the background is going on and I love that because it's it's playing with that we're going into death we're going into yeah. the other world and and, and uh, taking the soul of Deagle with us basically to the dark side because as much as Smeagol's changed Deagle's definitely changed as well we can't knock him out of the picture because he's he's definitely yeah, he just is. as quickly sort of like it's mine yeah, yeah, I think I think Deagle was was a little less murderous about it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a nice way of putting it. Murderously possessive, so to speak. Yeah, but it was, but when and when Smeagol let, uh, let go mm. of Deagle, you hear laughter, like, like, mm. like this evil maniacal laughter, and it's like the, <sighs> the ring. The ring knew what it was doing. Like it, it made that happen. It, it's it, a good that, scene. It's a really really good scene. I really like this. It's, it's really important as well because it also sets the fact that Frodo and Sam have both been exposed to the ring at an early, sort of early on in the film. And they've never, like, we've seen what it did to Bilbo in the end, but that, that's, you know, a really long period of time to affect somebody. Mm. And we've had a comparison where, you know, like you said, Smeagol has a history of looking into the, in, into the past, but at the same time, it was just instant. And I don't know whether that's because the ring's been hidden for so long and, and so its effect, it wanted to, to be found quicker. Um, and so it wanted to, to have this uh, immediate run back to Sauron. Or whether that Frodo and Sam have a, just a greater resilience to the yeah, darkness. But somehow Smeagol was almost predisposed to fall in, into the shadows easier yes. than, than others were. Something like that. Mm. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. I had, I had a thought then, but it, it, it escaped my mind. Um, but, oh, and that, that was it. So, so in the in the film, um, when they are when the Fellowship are in Moria, mm -hmm. and they're trying to decide which way to go, you know, yes. three choices. And Gandalf and Frodo are, are talking, and Gandalf sort of imparts some wisdom that you know many many who die deserve to live, and many who live deserve death, and blah blah blah. Um, and Frodo says it was a pity that Bilbo didn't kill him when he had the chance. Um, and Gandalf, in the book, he makes the, the point that it was the pity of Bilbo that allowed him to not succumb to the ring. So it was like, if he, if he had started his ownership of the ring um, with a murder, he would have succumbed like Smeagol did. Oh, that's a really good analysis. So, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I, was, I, I thought was... But it, and it's a shame that they actually they, they left it because it's just an extra line on the end of the little speech that Gandalf gives, um, and it's kind of a shame they left it out because it would it would. I mean, I, I don't know necessarily clear clear a few things up, but like it, it adds to the story, I think. Yeah, it, it does. It, it, it provides you know, clarity. Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. That's fascinating. I I had no idea. And see, when I was looking at it, I was I just saw before the transformation scene before we see Smeagol become like you know the, the, the golem creature and we see this period of time where he's, he's transformed we see that moment of him almost in glee like you say that mad laughter um, and then he get, becomes invisible and it I like the fact that he the invisible then tra like sort of they move the scene on to that transformation because it's almost like ah he becomes part of Sauron and therefore this is what you get for for murdering somebody and this is what you get and then it's almost a a really nice sort of transition between what you've just described between that moral action and then like and this is what happened to to Sweagel for doing this because of yeah. this murder's wrong kids don't do it um, yeah yeah literally it was like it, it was it was the it wasn't the ring that necessarily drove him underground it was the, it was the the act that he then took that was yes. was not good yeah i think in the book he also hid the body oh really so, so oh i didn't i forgot about that so as far as um, everyone else in the, uh, they, they didn't live in the Shire, they lived somewhere near the Gladden Fields, which is like near the River Anduin. Mm. Um, and they, the people that lived there, the hobbits that lived there, um, they, they couldn't find the body. And so, so Deagle, for all intents and purposes, just disappeared. Mm. Um, so yeah, but anyway. 
and yet he still got kicked out of the wood village, yeah. <laughs> even though they didn't find the body. Terrible yeah. detective skills from the village. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, an extra scene. So, so actually, no, I should probably sort of address the transformation of Smeagol. We see all of that. We see just the amazing effects from the team who do the makeup team. I love the, the fact of how they show, because obviously we've seen Gollum beforehand, in the in the two towers but we we never understood like how different he really was from his original form mm. and it's like the biting into the the cold fish the rocks um i love how he says the, the we forgot the sound uh the taste of bread and the and the feel of air of wind on his cheeks and uh it's a very nice description of cold hard environments taken away from the soft um, sort of what I class as the equivalent of winter to autumn. You've got autumn being this beautiful sort of multicolored, fresh, soft season uh, where Smeagol is in the village. He's living his hobbit life to the rocks, the cold, the the cold fish, and it's it's a very it's really nicely depicted. I don't know if you see it as much in that way as I do, but there's the... yeah, I mean it's kind of like a fall from grace, isn't it? It's like a, um, a he was banished from the Garden of Eden, so to speak, mm. and then it was and and because he didn't have any kind of higher ideal or, or anything, he just he just like became this wretched creature um, mm. that just hated existence itself but at the same time couldn't bear to be part of the ring so he didn't die yeah mm. it's uh it's a horrible existence horrible existence it's just <laughs> prolonged life you know how uh bilbo says i feel like uh too too little butter spread over lots of bread like that is a nice comparison compared to what Smeagol has to deal with it's just yeah. this horrible existence but mm. yeah move, moving on from that because that as, as that's a fantastic start to the film we see yeah. the true effects of the ring when you don't have an ideal like sam for frodo um mm. and or gandalf or, or yes Bilbo. and any sort of good you know sort of teacher or some sort of positive aspect in your life, um, which is a nice, nice thing to think. If you have negativity, you're surrounded by negativity, and therefore you will traverse further into more negativity. So, you know, that's another Jordan Peterson twelve rules for life little rule chucked in there for you. Um, then we have the extra scene, which I always like to see, which is Frodo and Sam and Outer Osgiliath, and uh, it it sort of shows a world that we start to see where darkness is really taking its hold on, on the world, where Sam thinks it's uh, it's evening, basically, because the darkness has, has taken over. And Frodo says, no, it's, it's not even midday yet. I, I wondered if you saw that and thought that the world is being affected by the, the, the fate of the ring, basically. I mean, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't really uh, thought of that, uh, to be fair. It's, good, it's a good point, I probably could Spend a bit of time thinking about it. I, I won't. I won't do it now. Um, but yeah, I, I did. I did quite like that scene because it's like you know, Frodo is like not sleeping at all. Mm. Um, and because it because it leads from the uh, Smeagol killing Smeagol, and then basically the first person we see is Frodo. Mm. It's kind of like he's sort of weighing. I don't know. May, maybe maybe I'm just clutching the straws here. But he's kind of like he's weighing up his options. Um, and obviously part of it is like his total peak domination over the people around him. Yes. But I think because he can see what happens to Smeagol, it's like, no, I won't, I won't do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> you don't want that to become a mirror image, do you? <laughs> I mean, he's, I mean, Gollum, he's definitely not aged very well, is he? He's a bit of moisturizer, done that way. So. But no, I, I like that. I, had, I did have some thoughts on that one. Um, but I don't know if it's... Probably not. I'll say it anyway, because it, it... Yeah, why not? I mean, the, the trouble is that um, when you re-watch these films like, multiple times, you end up seeing more and more things that may or may not actually be there. Yes. And that's kind of, that's kind of the trouble. Like, I, don't, I don't want to be like, tooting my own horn and thinking, oh, I'm, like, I can see all this mythological wisdom when it could just be a simple scene where they're just eating some bread. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, but yeah. You, you know, mate, I think that it's fun to do it anyway. There's no harm in it, is there? And I think no, no. that you get something out of it, and I get something out of it. So why not? So, so the Sam mentions the uh, the lemba spread rationing, um, and he's like, he's he's still. No, despite how far they've come, uh, yes. like despite all the horror and stuff they've seen, he's still optimistic about actually going home. And I love so that. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that. He's so optimistic that he's like, it's, you can't tell whether it's naive, naivety, yeah. or if it's genuine optimism. Um, but he's like, he's actually thought past the ring's destruction, and we're gonna we're gonna be going home. Like, so we've actually we need enough food to get home. Uh, excuse me. And it was like. Frodo had forgotten about the journey um, after that, that we would need to take it after the ring's been destroyed. It's like the only thing he can really see is, is the ring itself. Um, and he knows that like, this is the journey and it's also the ultimate end, so to speak. Like he's not thinking past what could, what he could happen, what he could do once the ring is destroyed. And I think, I think it might be in, in part because he knows in his heart that he won't actually succeed. Yeah. that he will fail when it comes down to it. Um, although, to just bounce back and forth between parts of the film, um, the very end scene, obviously, is Gollum basically falling in. Um, yes. And that happens in the book. It, it, Frodo doesn't push him in the book like they do in, like they do in the film. They don't wrestle him in the book. But in The Two Towers, when they first came across Gollum, um, Frodo made him swear by it that he would not bring him to harm or something. And I think it's because he broke his oath that the, the ring punished him without realising that it was going to die. And so it, it, like, it pushed him in. Um, so something like that, anyway. Um, yeah, I that think would, Oh, that's a nice connection, because as you said earlier, he was sort of the... When he committed an act of murder on behalf of the ring, almost, like having the ring in his hand, um, it's almost like the, the the word the bond of word or uh, of almost emotion and action have a real impact on what the what happens around the ring. That that makes a lot of sense, and that 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 bond clearly it could be why he fell in, and it was is mm. that the action. And, uh, but yeah, anyway, get, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I did have I did have one or two other things there, but I I think I don't think it applies. As such, I, th I think I was just reading in too much. You know, no, so, don't so worry, we, mate. We, you've got plenty, plan. plenty more to cover. There's so many things within this part of the movie. Um, the next bit's just a bit of fun. I, th I think the next scene after this is is you can't really read into it too much, but you can just enjoy it for what it is. Uh, and that's Merry and Pippin at Isengard. They're just too lovable. They're two lovable guys. So they're you know two characters who I think we could all associate appreciate their um, optimism for life in this scene. Mm. And uh, it's nice because we get that little comparison between who they are then and then who they are in, at the end of this movie because uh, it's it's very different two people. Yeah, it is because because it, it's almost like they they they've been to battle, they've gone through some hardship, and when when they're reunited, when they're, the heroes are reunited, they they've kind of grown up a little bit. Yes. But for them, there is actually still more growing up to do. Yes. Like they're just sitting back, like smoking and eating, <laughs> basically. And it's it's like they 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 for a, a short amount of time they've returned home. You know, to, to the Shire in a sense and like that so they've, they've gone back to what they would be doing anyway yeah exactly and they've got um, they've got Treebeard there and I love uh, I don't know if you saw this but Treebeard refers to Gandalf as young Gandalf how yeah, funny is nice. that <laughs> yeah I like that line that's, <laughs> that's a good one it's like it, how how much age difference is there between this guy and this guy? Like two immortal beings. Like yeah. <laughs> how old is Treebeard to say that? That's the question. I think um, I think um, I, I did have some Top Trump cards. I think I might mention this in the first one. Oh uh, really? I had some Top Trump cards um, which had the ages of all the, the beings, and Treebeard was one of them. And Treebeard, I think, is like seventeen thousand years or something in in terms of Middle Earth. Um, whereas Sauron is like 27,000 or 24,000 or something. Um, and because obviously Gandalf has only been around, been walking on the earth for... for he, he came at the beginning of the first, the third age, so I think it's like 
he's about three thousand years old. Ah. So compared to Treebeard, like he is, he is. That, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is a little bit younger <laughs> by yeah. four, fourteen thousand years. Just a little <laughs> sprog. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Yeah, th this is this is good because the next bit rolls onto a very so we've got this lovely sort of scene. It does it does bring me comfort that beginning bit with uh, Merry and Pippin because we've seen quite some harrowing scenes before then. We're seeing yeah. like Frodo's loss of will almost because he he's accepted his fate, and we've got this uh, very very dark beginning scene. I love it nonetheless, but it is dark. Uh, and then we have Merry and Pippin to sort of brighten us and say, like, oh, there is still good in this world, at least in, in some areas of it. Uh, but then we move on to, to Saruman, who's still kicking, even after losing the whole of Isengard and also his entire army, basically. Uh, but he's still dangerous. And I do like this um, idea that you've got Gandalf the White and then you've got Saruman the White. And we do see this nice comparison of the two what Saruman's become and what Gandalf is beginning to be. And because he's only been, a, you know, he's only been Gandalf the White for a very short amount of time. But I was intrigued to see when do you, when you compare them and if, if Saruman hadn't discovered Sauron in the art, uh, like the ball of, uh, I forgot what they're called, the seeing stones of um, uh, Palantir. Palantir, thank you. Um, do you think that he would have, gone down this road of still being Saruman the Wise? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about the, in, in the films, um, if it's expanded on at all, but in the, in the book lore, so to speak, um, Sar Saruman has been sort of planning this for like, like five, six hundred years or something. Um, he was actively searching for the ring um, based on his seal of notes and, and you know, where, where a seal that went missing and stuff. Um, so I, I think Saruman, he knew for a very long time that, or he, he thought he knew for a very long time that it was utterly hopeless to resist um, Sauron if he ever regained his power. Um, so what, what was your question again? Sorry, no, I, I, was, I, I was just intrigued. To, so if he hadn't discovered the Seeing Stone, I think you've already answered it here. In one way. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think he would have still mm. gone that way. I, I think that he, like I said, he thought it was absolutely hopeless. Um, and so the best thing to do is to just join with him. Um, but obviously, that's not the best thing to do. The best thing to do, <laughs> if, if it was hopeless, the best thing to do would be to die. Uh, yeah. But obviously, he didn't, he didn't choose not to die. Yeah, I like, uh, and we, we see this later in the movie, and, and when it won't be into the next podcast that we cover it, but how we get the perfect description of death by anyone I've ever seen in, in, in any movie. And that is with Gandalf and Ian McKellen describing death as this beautiful, just amazing picture. And then you see it. Uh, I'm not going to say the words because I will save it for the next one, but it is the, yeah. the perfect description of death. And, and he makes yeah. it sound like it's something that we should all be looking forward to rather than something we should be afraid of, basically. Mm. Um, but again... He's actually, he's actually seen it as well. He, he's actually done it. So yeah. And he's, he's conquered the unknown. And I think that's what Saruman has become like bad for because I think he's clutched too tightly onto life almost a little bit. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't willing to basically look into the next, but he might fail basically. Mm. He wasn't willing that, to accept. That he might have been wrong. That, that, would have been, that would have been a death in, its, in and of itself, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Saruman the Wise, who didn't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> it goes against his name, doesn't it? Yeah, but I couldn't see. Gandalf says in, uh, he might say it in the film, he definitely says it in the book, he says that even the wise cannot see all ends. And yes. So Saruman often thought he could see the only end, and he couldn't. So. He blinded himself, I think, because yeah. of that. He, his, his arrogance was, was the thing that fell. And it is, ironically, his arrogance that causes his death in this extra scene that we see uh, within the third film, in the sense that we have a little... The, the, I forgot, this is terrible, I forgot his name. It's uh, Gr Grey Grimmer? Grimmer? Uh, uh, Grimmer Wormsum. Grimmer Wormsum, thank you. Um, and I was, I was going to say, did you see this, the, the bit where you can see in his eyes that he, for a flicker of a moment, you, can, you think he might go back to Rohan? 
and uh, and join. I, I think he were. I think he was going to. Mm. Um, I think because he he kind of realised that Saruman didn't have his interest at heart at all, and that he wasn't actually free. That he was kind of a slave, but I, I think that he he initially believed that he was doing this of his own free volition. Mm. Um, but then when Saruman says he will never be free, yes. it's like, oh, <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Time for uh, you to die, my friend. <laughs> yeah, so he, he pulls out his knife. And, yeah. But it, 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 it's a little bit sad because also in the books that we see Saruman in a very different way. I remember Christopher Lee saying that he wasn't happy with the the end of Saruman because it was quite a um, what's the word? Grim end to him, but also not exactly um, magnificent in in how he he dies. It's it's very he's a man. They make him a man by dying in that way. He's 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 vulnerable. Well, he, he does he does die in the same way in the books. He is stabbed by, as far as I remember, anyway. He is stabbed by Grima in the back. Mm. Um, it's obviously that he obviously just dies in the Shire rather yes. than uh, on the top of Warfang. Yeah, I, I I understand why I did it for the for the films. It's um, I think the scene the theme, I think the theme still works um, because it gives with this scene in the book, him and Theoden obviously have their little chat, uh, and it's quite clear that Theoden is not gonna forgive what Saruman has done, um, and I, and I thought it was it was quite a fitting end because because otherwise in with the film. You know, it certainly lets the, if just take into account the extended edition. It's like four hours, twenty minutes long, um, yes. and by the time the ring gets destroyed, I think there's still an hour left. And so, obviously, in the, in the book, it's like half the book is is devoted to them going home. But you have to keep the audience captivated, uh, and it, <laughs> it it does go on a little bit. <laughs> uh, As it so does. Uh, as we I like to bring that Jack Nicholson quote in, there are just so many endings. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, okay. I think that it's, that's a really good way of putting it. And something that you mentioned in the previous podcast that is coming up now in, is that Theoden is a son of greater horse riders. And this is what Saruman basically tries to pick at him in this scene, is that you, this wasn't your victory. This was mm. the, the victory of your men, basically. You're not a great king. And we do see in Theoda's eyes that he's starting to question himself um, for one way or another. And we do see this in this part of the movie. I was wondering if you, you thought the same, if there was something that you... Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. He, he definitely, he's unsure if he's actually worthy of the king. Um, mm. I think because he, because firstly, he knows that he... He failed in it for a little while, uh, or he, he wasn't doing very well because Grima Wormtongue was obviously whispering in his ears. Um, but at the same time, he he's like he's not sure of his own strength, um, and he doesn't know if he has the the strength to really do what needs to be done for, mm -hmm. for Roha. Um, and yeah, Saruman like he cuts him to the bone by saying, "You are a lesser son, greater sire." Yes, and it's like. Mate, like especially for for a king like he's lost his son. Um, he it's like it's 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 true because the the kingdom is basically dead now because yeah. he wasn't a good enough king. Um, and so the prince, you know, the knight, the, the prince or the 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 king that would be is is absent, is vanished um, because the the king has failed at doing his job basically, and he knows that. Yeah. And so that's why like. <laughs> Yeah, that would hurt a lot. That would be a, a hard thing to hear. But then he doesn't. He doesn't. Um, he doesn't become bitter and like start to fight back with Saruman because he knows it's pointless anyway. And so what he does is he turns to Grima and he says, "Grima, you were not once a man of Rohan." Yeah. Um, and he says it in a way that's like Rohan, this great kingdom, um, like come down and will you not? Uh, he said to him, he, he basically says, like, become a man of Rohan again and stand yeah. on my side. And we, you, you know, we can work at forgiveness, basically. I'll, uh, I'm glad, again, fantastic point made is that he goes from taking this cut to the bone comment and forgive someone. Like, how great a character is that? The yeah, ability exactly. to do so. That, that would take some real, real strength of character to be able to do that. That would be difficult to not get, to not get like caught up in the immediate. 
that would be that would be a, a tough one to do. But I, I like that. Um, but when he says you were once a man of Rohan, like it, like it's a great this great place, and it, and it is obviously. Um, but then Saruman immediately uh, says like, what is Rohan but a, a fat barn where briggers drink in the week and the brats is on the floor with the dogs. And it's like, fucking hell, like, leave the guy alone, mate. <laughs> it's so true, though. He's just, like, he's just making, calling them savages, basically. Is yeah, this what it sounds like for, for like, he's calling them peasants, basically, yeah, as a high lord? Yeah, yeah like, with no, with, yeah, with no intelligence. And, it, and it's, kind of, it, it's kind of implied in that, in, in the books, that they, um, they don't write down any of their history, but they, they teach it in, in lore and, and um, stories and stuff. Yes. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's fucking leave me alone, mate. Mate, I know. And it, I think that there's almost a, a sort of level of respect in, in Grimmer's eyes for Faden to forgive him in the first place. He's like, oh, you forgive me? But I've done all this wrong. Like, how could you forgive me? Um, and I think that from there, he's just like, he sows his own fate basically don't know why Legolas shoots him but you know whatever maybe he's trying to save Saruman so that they can get information out of him but it's... yeah I, I think that was that that was the idea certainly that's what Gandalf wanted um, yes. because he, he was deep in the enemy's council as he said mm. um but yeah it is that uh, it, it's interesting because um the first part of the scene when they, when they first excuse me interact with, with Saruman Saruman kind of tries to uh, manipulate Theoden into saying, you're a man of honour, uh, can we not take counsel as we once did? Or can we not, can we not have peace as yes. we once did? Um, because you, cause you fought many wars and you've always sought peace afterwards. Um, and it's kind of implied that although Theoden is a great king and he has a lot of honour, you know, he, he, he understands that peace is better than, better than violence. All of the wars he's fought in the past against other men, perhaps um, he has. Once the battle is over, he he's tried to make peace so that the kingdom can flourish, and he's trying, you know, forget forget the violence, forget the a grudge, anything like that. Just let's not do this again. Let's work together. But because Saruman has fought with no honor whatsoever, um, because he says that the, you know, he he, he says got it, some of it here. He says, um, we will have peace when you answer for the burning of the Westfold and the children that lie dead there. And it's like, like your men killed children. And then yeah. not only that, your men killed and uh, butchered the bodies of our soldiers. And it's like, like one thing, is, to kill them is one thing. Like you're in, you're in a battle, fair enough. It's not good, but like, sometimes what will happen. But there's no need to butcher them you know, to hack them to pieces when they're already dead. Yeah. Because that's just, that there's not, there's, there is no honour in that. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's sport, but it's, it's like a It's savagery. Yeah. He, he becomes yeah, the exactly. very thing that he classes Rohan, believe it or not. Yeah. He, you know, the thing that he yeah. says that they're like rolling in the barns, well, you've just re unleashed hell upon these mm -hmm. poor people. So, you know, it's ir ironic in that sense and very mm -hmm. silly. It's, it's good that, because, because Theoden, he, he sees past, and obviously Saruman's voice is the is his power, um, and Theoden isn't uh, isn't succumb to it. Yes, it's it's interesting actually because when you read it in the book, the effect that Saruman's voice has on the different characters, they describe it as when he is speaking to you, it's like you go into like this dream state, and everyone else is just kind of normal, and then when he stops speaking to you. The dream lifts, and you realise that he like he's just trying to manipulate. Like it's, it's yeah. It's and by to, 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 that's it. a perfect way of putting it because he has that effect. It, I think it's also because Theoden also has had his mind manipulated by mm -hmm. Saruman before, so it's almost like oh, uh, I've I've heard these words before, basically. Yeah, yeah, he, he's almost inoculated in a way that you couldn't be otherwise. Yeah. You get into that horrible form that he had to deal with in the second film, mm -hmm. um, and and from there, we basically see the original version of the film where you you just have Treebeard say, 
uh, eyes and guards when flooded, I, I've taken control um, and washed away, and evil washed away, and you cut, and you don't see that nice extra scene, which gives a little bit of clarity, I would say, um, and also sort of relates to the book somewhere or another. Uh, and we get Pippin's first sort of interaction with the, the Seeing Stone, the Palantir, um, which is nice because it sort of brings it into why would Pippin want to look at this in the first place other than, you know, just picking it up. Um, and Gandalf's sort of makes it important. He makes the Seeing Stone seem more important than it than it is because of his saying, come here, boy, give it to me. You know, you shouldn't look at this. It's bad things. I'll and, that, my lad. Yeah, I'll take that, my lad. And he, um, as you said before, you've you've mentioned this in the podcast, is that they're children, aren't they? So yeah. it's almost like, oh, if you tell a child not to look at something, they're going to look at something. And and so it's very sort of clear what we'll see in the next couple of scenes, what happens to Pippin in that. Um, mm. And we move on to, I've got here, Hail the Victorious Dead at Edoras, which is the, the scene of, of victory, as they would call it, although very hollow victory for, for Thed and himself because it's his men who sort of rescue him. Yeah, but, and uh, honestly, when we're, we're at just, just before that scene, as yes. the, the company are riding back to Rohan, we have this beautiful, almost sorrowful, sorrowful music um, under the landscape of the... Of uh, the march, they call it. Yes. Um, yeah, it's nice. It's nice. And, you, and don't you have the Lord of the Rings order. go into the picture there? Isn't isn't that where the... Uh, no, that comes in just before uh, they see the hobbits in the previous scene. That's it. Thank you. So I missed that. I should have written that down. That's my bad. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's a lovely sort of picture, like you said. It's um, Whenever I see stuff like that, I always think of peace. So I don't know if that's my mind immediately making that relation, but it, you know, a, a beautiful countryside with uh, some sort of like just harmonious music in the background mm. does make me think of that. But, uh, mm. Yeah, there's not a lot to uh, to get from the next scene other than that Gimli's an absolute savage when it comes down to downing beers. Um, but you know, it is funny to see how pure Legolas is at the same time. You know, this thousand-year-old wood elf. <laughs> it's, like, it's like he's incorruptible, isn't it? Almost. Yeah. It, it really is, mate. I'm glad you put it that way because he's so just like, I think it's affecting me. Like, he says, I feel a tingling in my fingers. It's so funny. And you just see um, Eomir stood there just like, what am I watching right now? It's so funny. Um, it's a drinking game. I, I, I did. Uh, I quite like that scene. It, it was funny when I when I last watched it. I was thinking like how much beer you would have to have on hand to just to make Gimli pass out. <laughs> just uh, just that alone. Like it must be like the the logistical operation of like an entire city of Rohirrim. That must be like a hard <laughs> thing to to manage. Yeah. You got, you got to have food. You got to have beer. You got to have um, everything you need. People to, to live and thrive, like it's got to, and it's got to be a constant. You know, the wheels have to turn continuously. Um, yeah, and it, another it, it's, it's barrel not... of ale, another <laughs> barrel of ale, yeah, just like exactly. one after another. Like, where, where are you going to store all this? <laughs> yeah, not again, it, but, yeah. there's quite a few. You know, there's a hundred people at least in that. You know, the in the scene alone. So you've got to think of that. I mean, it's a little bit of fun. It is a nice sort of thought as well. What have I got here as well? But yeah. I, I, I did have one or two thoughts on that. Um, so one, one of the things you see is um, Eowyn is still obviously infatuated with uh, Aragorn. You've put it nicer um, than I did. I put Eowyn tried to shoot her shot and missed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think she's still waiting. I think, I think that, you know, a prim and proper lady in those times would, yes. would wait. He, he, yeah. she, she would wait for him to make the move. I, I yes. Think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she's she's like she's being around so that he can see her, you know, yeah. like deli deliberately in his presence. But then Theoden has recognised that um, the king energy, so to speak, has sort of passed in Aragorn. Like he he's kind of the true holder of of the, the mantle of the king. Yes. Um, and so he's he's obviously very happy for Aowen because he assumes that that's where it's going to go. Um, but yeah, anyway. But yeah. No, no, it's yeah. a nice. He, he, the thing is, it's recognition, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah. Theoden recognizes Aragorn as king. Um, yeah. 
which is ironic because his own people don't at the moment <laughs> until until later on far into the film but uh yeah it's it's really interesting scene and then you see the the hobbits dancing on the table making it look like we're back at the green dragon again i love yeah. that it's so so much fun um i, I I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that there wasn't more singing uh, yes because there, there's a lot of there's a lot of songs in the book and they're, 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 they're really good <laughs> yeah no exactly and it is i think the reason why Peter Jackson did it as well, and, and in this case, you've got one or two people who can sing in the film, uh, and, and Billy Boyd's being one of them who's a professional singer as well as, as Pippin. Um, at the same time, you've also got to think that singing provides joy, doesn't it? Except for yeah. the, uh, the scene with Pippin where he's deliberately making it look a little bit more negative later in the film. Mm. In in this case, I I do see this as the last point of joy in the film before we get to so, so it is like we see this joyous sort of event, and then it's quite you know dark, dark, dark yeah, at one bit after is, another. It's quite serious from from here on out, isn't it? It is, yeah. And yeah. I, I I don't I don't think if we had more singing, it would probably make things feel a little bit more lighthearted than they actually were. I suppose so, yeah, and it might. Because the film only has like a limited amount of time to, to set the scene and, and convey the information. So I suppose that's probably true, actually. It's like you can't, you can't have too many high points because the whole film will feel like a high point and you need, you need to like convey the seriousness of what's going on, I suppose. So, yes. Yeah. That makes sense. Makes sense. But there's plenty of chance. There's plenty of like, you know, uh, when, when battles come or when people uh, are preparing for war, there's plenty of things that you see both the orcs and the men do. So it's, it's very interesting to go down to that. Um, but yeah, that's as much as I got from that scene. Uh, mm. Apart from when Aragorn says to Gandalf, what does your heart tell you? And I do like that idea that Gandalf doesn't just think with his brain. He thinks like, mm. I can feel that Frodo's still alive and that he's still, you know, carrying on this journey. And that it's almost like you've said this before, and I do like this. I really do latch onto this a little bit is that these men are not afraid to show their emotions and not afraid to basically put forward their ideas that it's not just they're fighting to be men. They're fighting for, for the standards, the, the way of life, the ability to, um, be a man who has all parts of himself, the warrior, the king, the magician, the lover, all of them in, in this scenario. So for, for that scene, I do think that encapsulates that a little bit mm. in one way or another. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Now, I, I did actually have a, a similar thought to that for, for later on. Um, mm. So I'll, I'll mention that. I'll mention yeah, definitely. That. I'll, I'll look forward to that. I'll be intri intrigued because it is, I think it's a very continuous theme in this film. But anyway, uh, on to the next scene, which is Gollum's plan to murder, basically, I've got written down here. It's uh, it's uh, pretty... It's sad, because w we thought that in the previous film that we would have Smeagol sort of redeeming himself slowly, and he saw Frodo, and he thought, well, maybe I can go back to the way of, of being Frodo, basically, mm. the, the way of being on Smeagol. Mm. But... I don't know if you th you saw this. It's he brings back that mirror image of the ring. Basically, he's, you know, he brings back that second character of himself, who we, well, yeah. yeah, who we lost when he yeah. he said that Frodo was his now his ideal. Um, yeah, I, I think the the reason for that is because back in the Two Towers, uh, when Smeagol was being beaten up by the uh, the Tyrion Rangers, yes, um, he it was like a death of God motif. Kind of idea. It's like like uh, Frodo was the new god, but yes. Frodo wasn't actually up to the standard of a god. So the god then died, and then uh, Smeagol was plunged back into hell, and he didn't have any sort of compass other than for for now Gollum to come back and then to yeah. be his guide. And it's a shame, really, because it, it, it is um, in the, in the film it kind of makes it makes it seem like Frodo is the the reason for the, the fall from grace, so to speak. Um, but in the book, it's actually Sam, because uh, obviously when they go to Osgiliath and Gollum doesn't get beaten up by the rangers and stuff, um, and it is Sam who, because he doesn't trust Gollum, uh, he can't see Smeagol. All he sees is Gollum. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, that's a good way of putting it because sometimes we're blinded by our own sort of view of a person, aren't we? Where we we just see the the darkness within them, the the badness, or or, or sometimes there is no redeeming qualities, uh, even if there there are some and they're very small. You can't. It's overwhelming to you, and you try and write off a person. And I think that's what Sam's done there. And it's uh to be fair to him, that's difficult to do, you know, oh, to, yeah. to, to, to basically say this person's a terrible person, but I'm going to try and latch on to the good things that they've got going for them. Certainly, certainly because there's no, the only real um, history they have with Gollum is that he's been trying to kill them. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> starting off. Be, it'd be difficult to get over that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> someone tries to murder you. Ah, oh, yeah, forgive him, it'd be fine. We're all Jesus yeah. in our own life. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> so silly but yeah um there's not for, for me personally i didn't see a lot in that scene i didn't write loads of notes on it because it's just a very a continuous theme we've seen before where we're we're seeing um sam being sam frodo trying to see what's good left in Gollum, and Gollum becoming Gollum again basically mm-hmm. but i don't know if you saw anything more on that i do tell um i mean i've got just two little little lines. So Sam Sam judges him very harshly, obviously. Um, mm. But then Frodo is trying to kind of be the good guy. He yes. Doesn't want, he doesn't want to believe that he can become Gollum. So yeah, the negotiator of it. <laughs> yeah, and so he so Frodo Frodo can't admit that he's a villain, um, and because and it's because he can see that he will become that, um, and so he's kind of denying it almost. So like he. I, what I've got written down is that it, it's almost like he won't define the worst he could become, uh, even though, even though by doing so it might actually save him. Oh um, right, yeah, that's it's a good point. It could yeah, it could potentially save him, and it could potentially bring back. Oh. See, maybe that's what Sam needs to see as well, in in some way or another as well, is that Fro- he doesn't see Frodo for who for. Because Sam sees the journey back home, doesn't he? So when you see this journey back home, it's very difficult to see that there is no journey back home, isn't there? So we can just sort of play it both ways in that sense as well. Mm. Um, maybe. But again, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's the thing. There, there are definitely, and there, there are definitely themes that, that repeat. Or, or maybe it's not like, it's not like repetition. It's like um, you have like, points in the timeline that or it's like an equation it adds up to the disaster when it happened you know something like that yes yeah yeah but it's, it's a very good way of putting that because it does end up like that doesn't it we do we do have these little increment incremental steps of either for sam and frodo the 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 challenges they face as this mm. story goes on especially within this film because it really does focus on the last step of their journey that is the most treacherous that has the most enemies uh, that they have to basically overcome. Uh, Smeagol being one of them, because we sit, we see this. Uh, there's a trap he's setting for them, basically. Yeah. Um, and and from from that scene on, we've got uh, an extra scene again. There's so many extra scenes in this movie. There's it's just so much content they had to cut out because of how long it was. But it's um, Eowyn foreseeing the war and describing it to to Aragorn as she awakes yeah, from a dream. Yeah, in her dream. Yeah. So. It- so it's like so I, when I when I was watching that I I, I thought that it was like a, a kind of a recognition of her own shadow. Yes. Um, and it's like, and and there is some some kind of ideal um, that she has because there's light shining behind her, mm. um, and so it's like the, the light behind her is obviously showing her the outline of her shadow, um, and there's like may, maybe it, maybe it could be. Um, thought about in, in a bit greater detail at some point but it is I, I i sort of have this idea that it's kind of like a walking with god kind of motif which is what uh no see it's in in the judeo christianity ethos and in the mythology uh adam and Eve walk with god in the garden of eden it's like yeah. it's like kind of there's, there's some kind of hints that they, they're almost equal with god because they haven't fallen and then later on uh, Noah walks in front of God, and God is behind him, um, and so it's almost like the 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 highest the highest light, the highest star, whatever you can you can imagine, um, 
it is behind you in some sense. And if it, if you stand in the right direction, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking here, thinking aloud. If you stand and stand and face the right direction, the yeah. light will shine past you and it will illuminate everything around you, but okay. it will also show you your shadow. It will, like, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I see what I you mean. I don't know if there's any, I don't know if there's anything particularly important there um, for, the, for her dream, but. No, no, the thing is, Aragorn, in one way or another, is that light because she just sees him as this sort of like redeeming figure because he's a warrior, isn't he, as well as a king. And he's also somebody who consistently is there no matter what. He, he, he's, you know, he, he nearly dies and he keeps coming back. And so I do see what you're getting at with the, the bright light because he does sort of point out some of the flaws and some of them happen to be on third and, and I think by the end of this film, movie she starts to realise who she wants to be as well because of Aragorn because that description earlier in the second movie of her being in a cage it's only him who really sort of says says to her well why should you be there why should you you know ever have to deal with being in a cage you mm. can fight for yourself basically mm. um, so it could be that recognition it might not be who knows i think that it's 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 a nice way to think about it and that sh she sees him as her savior basically because yeah. there's no other man who's actually done that and he's not really a man he's 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 more of a an immortal being in some way or another Aragorn, but, um, yeah I, I know you mean it yeah he's, he's not just a man because it's very, you know, it'd be very hard for any man to ever obtain that sort of level of uh, sort of awesomeness that is Viggo Mortensen playing Aragorn. Uh, and I don't think any man ever will. But there you go. Um, next scene, I love this it, because it, it, it's got a lot of depth in it in the sense that Pippin and the Seeing Stone. We see this uh, and you've got that beautiful... Uh, stars are veiled in the sky where Aragorn and, and Legolas are looking out into the darkness. Um, and it, you've got uh, Legolas basically sort of in a meditative state. Um, and it's as if the darkness they're looking to looks back into them because <laughs> it's uh, Legolas immediately just has this moment of like, oh, it's here. And I was wondering, yeah. it, do, do elves have some sort of connection? to the ring as well because i was i was going to ask you this as well not not to the ring i i think um they do say it in the books um quite a few times actually which i i now am um, unable to recall it's something it's something like those who exist in both the shadow world and the world of light can perceive a lot more than more men can so it's, it's something like that i can't remember exactly what it is but it's like it's it's, it's kind of hinted that elves sort of walk in this um, they, they kind of walk along this line that is halfway between um, Shadow World and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just repeated myself there. Anyway. No, no, no. I, I see. Sometimes it takes twice as much effort to get it across to me, so I understand where you're coming from. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that makes sense because up till this point, there's not really been a good description of what Legolas is seeing. Because mm. in the previous film, we see Aragorn ask Legolas, "What do your elf eyes see?" We don't really get a description of how he's seeing it, what he's seeing, how, you know, what sort of vision is he seeing? Because all we see as the viewer is, is just the surrounding area. And yeah. so it's, it is almost like it's a realm that not even the viewer can see, mm. um, which is really nice. I, I do like that. It, it, one way to, put, to, to picture it, I suppose, might be, uh, you remember the Shadow of Mordor game? Yes. You obviously play as that ranger. Yes, um, and he can become a ringwraith. Yes, essentially, it, it's like like elves walk in both of those states simultaneously, something like that. Like in some some kind of it, it does, and it's it's that shadow realm that he enters, doesn't it? That that yeah. that, that they have the ability to walk into. That's a very good way of putting it. Uh, it, it visually speaking, I always love that in that game because it gave it such game. a good representation of what the shadow mm -hmm. world is. Um, and then, actually, that's a really good link, Ollie, as well, because we actually have the the Palantir, which is a sort of a stone that you can see the the, the shadow realm into. It's it's a connection between realms, mm. and that's how. Um, and in that game, ironically, the Palantir are the things that Sauron is seeking to be able to basically control different parts of the world in Middle Earth. Okay, okay. Um, 
and the ring wraiths are sent out to, to achieve them. I think that's either in the War of the Ring, where in the second game, where you see uh, the ring wraiths basically take the Palantir, where I'm pretty sure the Witch King controls one in his home in uh, Minas Morgul, I think. Yeah. Um, so okay. it's quite a, a dark entity of a, of, a, of a ball of fire that we see that uh, is picked up. Um, fool of a took, as uh, Pippin is, to, to look into it. Well, I, so I think um, if I just go back to where I was earlier. Um, yeah. The Palantir, the, the Palantir for Pippin, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like the ring in a sense. It's like a view into his own shadow, which I don't think he had been given previously. Um, and once he had sort of um, an introduction to the shadow, it's like you like you kind of need to see a bit more because it's otherwise it would just be gnawing away at you. Like it's like the shadow is like it's right there, and you do actually need to have a look at it. Um, and it's like the first introduction; he he just cannot avoid it. Um, and so so what I've written what I've written here is that uh, people just cannot avoid gazing into the abyss. Um, only this time the abyss gazes back. Um, oh, that's so good. I love that. That's yeah. a fantastic line. <laughs> that's so that, well put. That's something, it's something that echoes what Nietzsche said, which is that if you spend long enough gazing into the abyss, it will, like, something might gaze back at you. Um, and obviously this time it was Sauron, uh, which is like the ultimate manifestation of absolute evil in the world. You know, yeah. Like that. And it's, yeah. Um, so, and, and obviously because of that, because he is <laughs> like he gets the little view of the shadow in, when he first sees the Palantir, and then when he actually picks it up and stares at it, it's like bang. He's like he he's shown the entire the entire content of hell, so to speak, and it's like it's downloaded into his brain. That that's why he's like sh shook and there, isn't he? He's like so pale and so yeah. just sort of sweaty that he's just sort of stared into the abyss, like you said. It's like it's too it's too much for him. Like he can't he can't actually sustain it. Although he, although he does sustain it, um, but he like it is it is too much at the same time. Like he wouldn't have been able to do it for very long. Yeah, and even with Aragorn who picks it up, even he faints by picking it up. So there is that strength comparison there where even Pippin's able to, to withstand that. So it's quite interesting to see there. Um, and we, we have, while Pippin's able to see into Sauron's mind, we see that beautiful burning tree. Um, and I love that imagery. It's fantastic because it's it's the foresight into seeing uh, Minas Tirith, but it's also this just sort of hell is being unleashed upon um, Minas Tirith and, and the burning white tree is that symbolic representation. So, Definitely. yeah, it's fascinating. I love that. I love that. And um, I think that scene as well, is also where we start to see where Pippin is actually going to become a quite a big character within this film. Uh, and while he does want to stare into the abyss, it's the ability to want to stare into the abyss into the first place that shows a little bit of curiosity um, and what the hobbits are. They, they are curious about the world around them for, for these four hobbits in comparison to their own kind. So it is, again, displaying that they're, they're a little bit different and uh, they, yeah. they do belong in this story. And they and they definitely are resilient in a way that uh, men don't seem to be. Uh, yes. As you just pointed out, when when Aragorn fainted, Pippin, he 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 was holding on to it for much longer, so he did mm. he did obviously pass out. But you you can kind of get a sense for Frodo's resilience to or resistance to the ring, um, and that's like how I, I suppose maybe that's like a, a trait that it, or an ability that is innate in, in Hobbit somehow. Yeah. Well, I think it's also, uh, this reminds me of what Gandalf says gives him strength. And he says this in the Hobbit movies. He says that it's the the little good it's sort of rivers and the little faith and then the, the good acts performed by Hobbits that give him hope and that he's scared. Yeah, and small that, acts of kindness. Yes, exactly. And I think that's what it is. I think that that's what Gandalf sees in the Hobbits and the Hobbits are so strong because they don't see the big wild world. They only see the, the small good and, 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 and the small bad. And maybe that restriction of the mind helps them against the, the great darkness. Yeah, but, it uh, could do. 
who knows? <laughs> um, and then we have from there, what do we owe Gondor? I like that line. I like that. What do we owe Gondor? We're, we're said and basically saying, why should I back up who none of whom who have backed me up? Um, and I was wondering if you saw that and thought, nah, fuck Gondor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's there, definitely, um, it's definitely like a question. Uh, it, it's like a test of, of Theoden's kingship. So to speak, yes. isn't it? It's like, is he, is he really worthy of being a king? Um, and it, and it doesn't, it doesn't sound like he would be. Um, obviously, later when he does. But before, just before that. Um, Obviously, now seen is they're in the Golden Hall of, of uh, Nebusel. And once again, Gandalf is narrating the, the events, effectively. He's, he's basically telling the viewer what is going to happen. So, like, Sauron is going to press his advantage in here, there, and everywhere, and he's going to do this, and blah, blah, blah. And you need to be ready for war because Gondor cannot fall. Yes. Because if Gondor falls, then it, it's, it's all over, basically. It's all finished. And, and yeah, and, and Theoden is like, but they didn't help us. So like, so why why would we help them? And it's like, well, firstly, you didn't ask for help. That's the first thing. Um, and so maybe there is an element that you kind of brought it on yourself, uh, in a sense, because it because in one of the themes in in the two towers with Theoden was that he didn't want to have the fight. He was kind of running away from it, and it was only at the very end when he sort of rediscovered his warrior spirits that he actually took the fight to the enemy that was when the uh, when Aomer appeared with all the other Rohirrim and it's like that so, like those like Theoden had to become a warrior again yes. a proper warrior uh, and take the fight out for the rest of Rohan the kingdom of Rohan to see that he was the king you know so like like something like that and and obviously where am I going with this? Um, no, I, I do see what you're saying because he's. It's it, only when he embraces the warrior spirit that he truly gains the positivity that comes from that and the results that he gets from that. And yeah. by him saying, "Why should we defend Gondor?" is actually make him receding as a character. He's becoming the yeah. person he used to be rather than the person that he should be and he could be. Um, mm. uh, I, I think that that's a really well put point and I think that's really important because in my opinion Theoden does become that person later down the line in the film and oh, yeah. I think that he he does prove himself in the end mm. and he gives everything for it and it, it's also um, I think I'm still yeah well, I have something else there but never mind but yeah but it, it's basically from, from what I can tell in that scene uh, Gandalf so, so Gandalf and Aragorn both kind of have the, the vision of Horus, so to speak. They can see what's coming. Pippin now has that as well, I think. Yes. Like a very small dose, so to speak. But he was able to communicate it at least and, and tell Gandalf that there's another plan. Um, I feel like I've missed a, 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 a scene here. But, but yeah, it is, it, it's an important moment because then obviously they then Gandalf yes. can ride off to... What? Uh, you see, you have you haven't missed a scene at all. It's it's very a short cut. It's very the, the, there's like a very sort of Pippin takes the Palantir and then he looks into Gandalf's eyes and it's like cut and we're back into the the hall and it's uh, that planning scene then. Um, so it's 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 a very sort of condensed like oh my god this is a lot of information to take in all at once sort of thing. Mm. Uh, yeah, and 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 it they're right. It, it does become quite a bit of a slow burn at the beginning. And then we're getting quite a lot of action happening now because from here on out, you've got uh, the plan basically to rescue Gondor from the, from there, from this part of the storyline. And the story gets chopped up into different perspectives uh, from, from here. And I, I, do, you, do you know why that is in any way, shape or form? Um, no. <laughs> That's all right. No, I'm, I was just intrigued because yeah. for, for me, I think it's uh, it's a common thing done in books sometimes to have multiple perspectives, um, and it sort of makes the it's something that annoyed me in the previous film was constantly having to deal with seeing uh, Merry and Pippin scenes, which weren't nearly as interesting as the battle sequences uh, yeah. that we saw within Helm's Deep. But I think it also goes back to what you said earlier. If we have loads of highs and 
lows it's not really going to make a great story sometimes and mm. so you have to have these different changes in perspective um to to basically keep that story going mm. but anyway we're, we're, we're moving on into the next bit where we're we're going with uh mary so pippin and gandalf go to gondor it's very short you just see them leave within very you know, he says goodbye to mary there's a very sort of short period of time where he's like the enemy knows who you are they you think mm. he thinks you have the ring mm. um and yeah, i like he knows, that he knows that a halfling have, has it doesn't they? exactly and mm. so it's this sort of they're going to use that to their advantage as a way to basically draw the heat off frodo and say that pippin has the ring let's mm. move him to, to gondor to keep his eye fixed on gondor Mm. Um, which is smart move from Gandalf's part. It's, it is a, almost as if he can see into the future. Oh yeah, definitely. Certainly because he think because he knows that Sauron would is thinking that the men are going to use are going to try and use the ring against him. Yes. And so I think he he's like he's kind of playing into that into the. It, it's not necessarily a trap, but it's like we'll we'll just let him continue to think that. Because because Sauron it. still thinks men are weak, no matter what yeah. happens, basically. Yeah. 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 Well, they are they are kind of weak, but yeah, we can just end up saying it a bit later on. But I, I, actually, just on that, I, I had a I don't know another kind of thought on it, going back to the two towers um, when Faramir decides to let the hobbits go. Um, it's only after Sam tells him um, that his, the reason that his brother is dead is because he tried to take the ring. Yes. And so it's like if you imagine Boromir to Faramir. Uh, Boromir is like the best Gondorian, the best man in Gondor that there's ever been. Um, and it's like, like this powerful moment of realisation, like he, he's going to do what his father would want, because that's what his father would want, and, and so on and so forth. And then he learns that Boromir died because of, because he tried to take the ring. Yes. And it's like, so if, if the greatest man in Gondor made a mistake, then I need to not make the same mistake. Because if if Boromir fell to such an extent, and he was such a hot, such a great man, what's going to happen to the rest of us? Because it'd be the same thing, and it might be it might be much quicker, or you know whatever. Um, and and I think that's that's kind of the moment of realization in that film that, that why why he lets them go. Yeah, I think that's also a really important statement as well is that um Far faramir's realization and we see that in the, in this film is that faramir seems to be the only person who understands that actually boromir wasn't perfect and it's as if gondor still thinks and his father as well still thinks that boromir was perfect um and and then there's this sort of like comparison happening consistently and you know we'll talk we'll talk about that in, in a bit but it's really interesting i'm glad you brought that out um and we're moving on to a, a very different scene here that um, I think, again, bringing into premonitions and bringing into foresight is uh, the Elven Road, where Arwen is traveling to, to the Sea Haven. Mm. And he, she sees her and Aragorn's son. And it's a very, I think it's quite a beautiful scene. It's really well shot. It's got a lot of... It's, what I would class as like a misty, very like you're in a dream state. It does yeah, feel like that, yeah. doesn't it? And yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. I love yeah, the colours. It's great. Mm. It, yeah, because they're, they're kind of walking in like the moonlight, aren't they? They're, yeah. Is that the one, is that the one they move in? They're, they're not walking during the day. It's like they're moving in the twilight somehow. Um, and then and she obviously, yeah, sees some some kind of hall or. Um, House in Minas Tirith that's made of stone, and yeah, sees the sees the king, and then obviously sees the, the prince as well. So, but it's it's like so. I, I was thinking about this. So, it's like Arwen as the. I'm probably going to absolutely butcher this, so I won't <laughs> go it, for it. it. But it's like her her spirit is is leaving. Right, she she kind of lost hope, um, but she does through the fog. And through the despair, so to speak, she does see some kind of, of glimmer of light. She does see a ray of hope, so to speak. I think I've got those mixed up in the mind. Um, and it's like it's the potential future she can have if the land is, if the kingdom is restored. Yeah. Um, and she's not willing to kind of give up on that. 
um, because she, and the reason for that is because she has such an enormous amount of faith in Aragorn. Because it's basically, if Aragorn proves to be the man that she believes he is, uh, he's going to succeed, and, and that's kind of that. that that's kind of it. Um, but it's like it's Elrond who tries to convince her that she's wrong. Yeah. Um, which I don't know. Not it, it, you can kind of you can you can understand where he's coming from because he he knows that if she stays, she's going to die no matter what. Yeah. Um, and it might be it might be that she dies. Uh, what, what is it? When he when he's talking about Aragorn, how Aragorn will die by the sword or the slow decay of time. Yes. The same thing will happen to her. Yes. She has to give up her immortality. Yeah. Uh, and so that no, he knows that once once she she gives it up, that's that's it. She's sure she's going to die. And it might be you know even even though even though it's what she wants, she's still going to die. <laughs> and that's like and, yeah and exactly. Not only that, she's not able to go through the. Uh, the Valinor across the sea. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's important you've said that because also you've got to think that um, he saw 3,000 years ago Aragorn's ancestor fail. And so he's seen failure before and he thinks the same thing will happen again. No matter how, you know, he raised Aragorn, it doesn't matter. He still thinks that the world of men will fail once again. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I think he sees that his daughter is his last sort of shining light in this world. Um, and he doesn't want that light to go out. Um, it's 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 really important because it's important to say that nothing is certain in life, mm. and this is really what this scene's about. Is that you know she's putting her stock in the in the future of positivity, and Elrond's like, nah, mate, it's all going to crap. Let's throw down the you know we we need you to get out of here. Yeah. Um, but I think the reforging of the sword and hit her persuading him to do so is basically putting their faith in the world of men, putting their faith in, in yeah. these weak guys. But I think it's the weakness that is the reason why they succeed in the end. It's that Aragorn accepts that he had weak ancestors and that he himself has those weaknesses. It's that accepting yeah. of that that works. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And that's kind of what happens when he goes into the path of the dead. Exactly. He, goes, he goes deep into the unconscious um, of people who are dishonourable. Yes. Uh, um, traitors. But yeah, traitors. And like, like, like they're they're cowards, and they they ran away from the fight when they when they shouldn't have. And it's like he he needs to acknowledge that he has all of those traits as well, um, but to still do the right thing nonetheless. So exactly. Exactly. It's really powerful because you think that um, it is this is the beginning of him becoming king and this is the, the yeah. beginning of him taking that road. I know it's not in the book. I know it's only in the film that this is part of it, but I think it's really well done by Peter Jackson in the sense that, you know, this is the road to, to you becoming the, the Lord of Gondor, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the best man. The yeah. I think it's something that we see, there's a lot of great imagery. I'm not going to go all of it because there's, you know, there's so much within that one area of Arwen going from the, the Elvron road, for seeing her son and then coming back to Elrond and there's her like in sort of the book falling from her lap, the, the sort of almost like a very different vibe going on um, at her home at the time. Cause you look yeah. at the, the, the sort of skies and, and the coloring, it's very different to when Bilbo and Frodo were there, isn't it? No, it's not as bright as it? it. It's kind of monotonal. Um... Yeah, or monochromatic. Yeah. It's not not very yeah, not very colourful. Like the, the the light has gone out of it somehow. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. I think I think that's what changes Elrond's mind is that he kind of realises that his daughter's dead, uh, regardless. Even if she leaves, she's going to be so heartbroken that she will die anyway. Yeah. Um, because when he when he grabs her hands, he says, "Your hands are cold." You know, the the light of the. Uh, Evening so star, evening, wasn't it? it was, star, yeah. yeah, something along those lines. The last lines. evening star is leaving you. Um, mm. And it's like, it's it, in part because she has voluntarily given it up, but it's also in part because she's like the, the partnership in the woman of the kingdom. And, yes. You know, and, and she needs to be there because the kingdom needs a queen. Um, and 
eventually, but obviously the first one really is the, the king. <laughs> yes. So it's, 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 yeah. she's she's the future strength of, of of man, even though she's part of the Elrond race, which is, you know, yeah. it's, it's quite uh, a nice sort of forming of two races as well, and and, mm. and burying the hatchet, as one might say. Yeah. Next um, bit. Yeah. This and then, is... so then Anduril is uh, is reforged. Obviously, it's not it, the name given to it. What what does Anduril it, mean? That's, that's what I was going to ask. Do you know what it means? It means flame of the west. Oh, I like that. That's good. That's good. That's seriously cool. So it's uh, so Anduril. So Narsil is the thing that defeated the devil, and it's and it's removed. Um, and it's like so in the. I don't think she says the full poem. So they say the, uh, what's the all of gold does not glitter. You know, she 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 recites part of that poem, I think. Okay. But I don't I don't think she recites the whole thing. But one of the lines from the book, um, funny enough, that the poem is actually written by Bilbo about, <laughs> which I quite like. I that was quite cool. Um, is that the, the old that is strong does not wither. Um, and the, so you have this blade that's been broken for a long time, but because it is strong, um, all it kind of needs is re, you know, put back together, and then it's like it's the same blade that it was that it once was, although it's now wielded by someone else. And so, and, and it is a new blade in a sense because it is. I think they they give it like elvish enchantment or whatever, um, and it's given to the, to the rightful king. Um, and so it, it's kind of like an Excalibur. Kind of thing. It's like it is, yeah. Like yeah. Legend. It, it's the the sword that can unite the the realms of men. Uh, That's a really good comparison because also you have to think that Arthur had to to pull the sword from the stone in order to to, to get it as well. And in this case, we're reforging it from uh, the flames of the elven uh, elven yeah, world. It, it's like it was useless for a little while, and now yeah. it's um, it's used to been restored. Yeah, yeah. like that. That's really good, and uh, we we move on from from that to you've you've got this sword that's going to unite men, and we see the broken city of men, which is Minas Tirith. It's a very the quick transition. City of kings. Yeah. Yes, the city. I'm glad I've got that written down as well. The city of kings. Yes, and it's not really anymore, is it though? So it's a broken city because yeah. you you've got a man Denethor who's leading it, who is neither king, and he's a steward who's basically. What I think you put it well last time. He's like a lord, basically. A, um, yeah, it's like a caretaker of the throne. Basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we we see how bitter and full of ill will he is within this scene. And it's it's a really important uh, scene between Gandalf, uh, Pippin, and Denethor here. So ju just before we get to that. So oh yeah, yeah. What, what have you seen? It's it's the. It, it, it's nothing particularly artificial, I, I would say, but I, mm. I, I wanted to read the description of Minas Tirith from the book. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do like this. It's, it's only, I don't know, a couple of, couple of lines. Not no, do, go, go for it. I haven't read aloud for a long time. So <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> go. Not very well. so, so you imagine that, you know, it's like this grand, majestic, uh, yeah. City that looks like it's been carved out of a single piece of stone almost. It's like like the the rock has been taken back and revealed this seven leveled, uh, thousand foot high city. And it's like it's beautiful and it's white. It's like this shining jewel in the mountains. That's a, um, that's exactly how I did picture it. A jewel in the in the eye yeah. of Gondor. It's brilliant. Yeah. It, and it sits. Uh, I, I texted you this. I think didn't I? It, it sits opposite. Um, Mordor. So it's it does, yeah, the shadow. Yeah, shadow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think, I think in part is why Denethor is, is kind of loses his mind because all he can see is the shadow. He can't actually see the, maybe because he never leaves the city and he never looks up at its majesty, um, and so he's kind of he loses his faith in it. Um, but I, I just just read it quickly. Yeah, yeah, I, go for it. There you go. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah. For the fashion of Minas Tirith was such that it was built on seven levels, each delved into the hill, and about each was set a wall, and in each wall was a gate. But the gates were not set in a line. The great gate in the city wall was at the east point of the circuit, but the next faced half south, and the third half north, and so to and fro upwards, so that the paved way that climbs towards the citadel turned first this way and then that across the face of the hill. 
and each time it passed the line of the great gate, it went through an arch tunnel, piercing a vast pier of rock whose huge outthrust vault divided it into divided into all the circles of the city, save the first. For partly in the primeval shaping of the hill, partly by the mighty craft and labour of old, there stood up from the rear of the wide court behind the gate a towering bastion of stone, its edge sharp as a ship keel facing east. Up it rose, even to the level of the topmost circle, and there was crowned by a battlement, so that those in the citadel might, like mariners in a mountain ship, look from its peak sheer down upon the gate, 700 feet below. The entrance to the citadel also looked eastward, but was delved into the heart of the rock. Thence, a long lamp, a long lamp-lit slope ran up to the seventh gate. Thus, men reached at last the high court, and the place of the fountain before the feet of the white tower, tall and shapely, fifty fathoms from its base to the pinnacle, <coughs> where the banner of the steward floated a thousand feet above the plain. I thought there, I, I, thought, I thought that was like quite a beautiful, almost poetic description of like this this great city that is, is uh, keeping the forces of Mordor at bay. I quite like that. I like that it talks about it how it carves into the rock. The, the there's a very sort of strong but beautiful vibe to the city in that sense and uh, it does make you think in that description as well how important the city is and it's not just some sort of normal city it's seven levels and it's got all these bar barriers and doors and it's you know it's, it's got this beautiful pale white citadel it's the description alone shows how um, this is the city of men. This is yeah. the height of all intelligence and, 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 and uh, earthly the values. Yeah. Yes. This, this is the pinnacle of what, of what mankind has so far achieved. Yes. Ironically held by a man who could barely tie his own shoelaces sometimes, it seems, when you look at Denethor. Yeah, um, it, does, it does seem that way. But... I love that description, mate. I'm so glad you read that out because it is really important to understand how this is Aragorn's basically his what he needs to uh, not own, but he needs to control in somewhere. I, those those aren't words that are probably best way to describe it. But he he is the heir to this. This is his kingdom. He is the the yeah. heir to the city. It's almost like he's going to earn it. You know this beautiful yeah, yeah. city. Definitely. Um, and and. I like I like the fact that the the, the white tree of Gondor, uh, the the tree of life, um, sits atop the stone kingdom. It's like it the, the kingdom is made of solid stone, and yeah, and it's yeah, and then you have something living. Well, actually, no, it, it is technically dead, I suppose, at the top. At so the moment, yeah. Is, yeah. Um, yeah, I like I quite like it. Yeah, because you've I, got I, that. I, I love I love the the language Tolkien uses. It's so like it's so. There's almost like a melody to it. Um, yeah. Anyway, he he's uh, he's getting uh, the rhythms of life across, and I do like your point there, where the tree is on top, because it's almost like the stone and everything, and the everything points to life. And I know, and the tree's dead at the moment because it's controlled by lesser men, uh, and that when it is controlled by the heir of Gondor, hopefully, it can thrive again and life can thrive. Yeah, important important point to make because it is the rhythms of uh, Tolkien. Um, yeah, <laughs> and after you talked about that, I feel like this is such a like negative seed to talk about in comparison <laughs> to the beautiful description that you've just pointed out. Because um, De Denethor is just you know he's he's not a fun character, and you've got Gandalf trying to be the negotiator basically on on behalf of Rohan and 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 the rest of the men basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Denethor is almost like stubbornly um, refusing. He's like, no, I don't care. Like, if everyone dies, I don't care. Like, yes. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, yeah, what's the word where, he, not, not patriarch, um, it's, it's something along the lines of uh, where, where you just uh, kill yourself in the name of everyone else, basically. You're, uh, you're a martyr, I think the word uh, is. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, he does, he does immolate himself, obviously, doesn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very good point. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, he does do that. Uh, see, again, I saw an image today 
uh, of Boromir with like a thousand arrows in his back, and it brings back the the words that you spoke in the, in the last uh, podcast about it was not just one arrow that pierced Boromir; it was many. Um, yeah. And this is a really important point that Pippin makes in, in this scene. And I want you to, to describe it now because you said it best in the previous podcast. So I think it's, um, it's really good. So, so obviously, they, as they get to the, the top of the citadel, um, mm. I, I don't think you miss out. Like, they're, they're, they're at the top of this, you know, this majestic city. Um, and then there is, there is the king's chamber, whatever it's called. I, it does have a name, but I can't remember what it's called now. Um, but as you walk in, you've got like uh, stone effigies of, of kings, you know, in times gone by, and they're like yes. holding things like they're looking like super philosophical and, and stuff like that. And then you obviously, at the end of the hall, you have the some stairs going up to the throne, and then you have the steward sitting beneath it, uh, and obviously that's where Denethor's sitting. And he's kind of sat there, like looking a bit dejected, and uh, if that's a word. <laughs> and looking a bit sad and like looking uh feeling sorry for himself almost but he's also like angry at it yes like he, he's, he's, he's ready for a, a fight of some sort but it's like he's not really looking in the right place for it mm. it's just and like any fight will do and i'm just gonna roll over anyway <laughs> um and so it's like yeah so so pippin pippin's walking in and he he obviously is kind of overwhelmed in a sense by the, the majesty of, of what he is in because there's history in and it and there's stone pillars and in in the book I don't know if, it, if, if it's right there I'll read it if I can see it immediately I'll read it but if not I'll just let it go um, but it's, it's yeah so it's, it's basically the, there's like stone pillars that reach high up into the into the, the roof and stuff and it's like like the, the city is still going, so to speak, and there's still a lot above it. Um, it's, it's a lot yeah. different to, let's say, the Shire in comparison. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know? definitely. It's, it's, yeah, it's like this grand hall, and it's like it's even more, it's even more grand than uh, uh, Rohan. Yes. It, it, Rohan is made of wood. Yeah. Um, although me, me, the Golden Hall of Magistral is obviously on a, a bed of stone, but it is still... Like yeah, but that, that's their greatest achievement, isn't it? Really, yeah. so it's it's very different in comparison. And and so Denethor is sitting there, uh, and Gandalf tries to appease him by saying, "Hail Denethor, son of Excelion, Lord yeah. and Steward of Gondor." And obviously, he doesn't really. I I'm not, I guess he doesn't really like hearing his title of Steward because it's like it just reminds him that he's not king. He's not. He's not sat in that seat. He's in this one here. Yes. Um, and so, yeah. And so he has the horn of Gondor uh, on his lap. And he says, perhaps you come to explain this to me. Um, and then obviously Pippin steps forward and, and says he died by uh, protecting my kingdom. Um, and it's it, he actually says it in the same line in the book. Is uh, how, how could a man mighty as he... Um, or whatever to, uh, to to you yeah. when there's just orcs in front of them, and he and he and Pippin says the line which I've said in all podcasts so far that the mightiest man may be felled by one arrow, and the foreign is pierced by many. And in, in the book he says I last saw him uh, leaning against or sitting against a tree and he plucked an arrow from his side. And so it's, it's almost it, it's kind of hinted at that he was pierced by more than three arrows anyway. Um, I think that was just a good uh, visual for the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, the, and Pippin is obviously realizes that it wasn't it wasn't his fault, of course, but he does he owes some kind of debt because he is he is. I don't know that he's necessarily alive because of what Boromir did, um, but Boromir was a, a truly a great man, um, and, he, and he, Boromir died for the Hobbits, um, and so he, he owes the debt. And so he attaches him, you know, he, he sort of, imagine looking into the plants here, he's kind of woken up uh, yes. and he's growing up faster now and he realises that he needs, he needs like a structure of some sort that he can attach himself to. So he offers him, he offers to become one of the guardsmen or, you know, whatever, whatever service he can, he can do. So, um, 
Yeah, and then obviously Gandalf and him argue about everything. <laughs> Gondor is mine! <laughs> well, I, I like that he says, do you think the eyes of the White Tower are blind? Um, and it, yes. Because obviously in the books, he had his own Palantir. Um, and so he, yeah, he that is see. definitely, yeah, suggested, isn't it? In the sense, like, the reason why he's so, like, crooked and just sort of depressed into his own chair is because he's been looking into the Palantir and the Palantir's been looking back at him. Yeah, and, and all, and obviously the, the Palantir is only, or maybe Sauron, is only showing him sort of half-truths that are, that the world is never going to going to fall and, and so on and so forth. And so he's, you know, sees this coming darkness, but he's not really willing to do anything about it because he doesn't think that there's anything that can be done. Um, and that there is we might not even get to it in this podcast, but there is that, that uh, scene when he's just about to burn him, himself and Faramir alive. And there, there's this there's this like intense dark music. Um, and obviously John Noble's acting it's just abs- it's so good. It's such a powerful scene because it's very similar, I thought, to the scene with Saruman. Yes. Like the way it's sound and the, the music and stuff. And it's like it's like saying there is no hope. Um, he, he basically says, he basically says, you may triumph on the field of battle for a day, but against the power that is risen in the east, there can be no victory. Yeah. Um, and it's like he, 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 it's such, it's such a powerful scene um, because it's like it's interspersed with all this battle, you know, the fighting below and the stuff like that. And he's holding, he's holding this bit of uh, this this torch that he can burn himself and and his son. Uh, and he's staring, he's like glaring at Gandalf with like hate in his eyes. And he's like, you're, you're a fool. There's nothing you can do here. You're the best thing to do is just to die. <laughs> and it's like, like it's, he, he's lost all hope basically. And that's like, the, that's where it's going to go. Um, it's a very so different it, to um, committing uh, suicide in Japan in the sense that with with him, he's he's he's... He's trying to end his life because he sees no hope. Um, but in, in Japan, they consider it a, a way of basically admitting defeat because you've lost the battle, um, not because you think you're about to lose battle, if that makes sense. So it's it's more in, um, it's, I think the word is committing seppuku, um, where you've you've been shamed, basically, and that you've oh, lost um, your honor. Your honor has been lost, and it, to an extent, you can look at him and think, "Well, yeah, he's lost some honor because he did say, abandon your post, flee for your lives in front of all of these people." But um, you know, at the same time, it's redeemable, isn't it? There's not the battle isn't lost yet, uh, and and so yeah. there there is still hope left. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, it, it doesn't come from Denethor. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, and I think partly because he's not a good leader. Um, and despite the fact that he sees the oncoming storm, um, he doesn't use whatever power he has to kind of you know, to stop it. Um, and if you imagine, I, I wrote this down earlier, the, the capacity to see, so, so leadership is um, the capacity to see what is in front of your face in every direction, and then the capacity to use your language properly in a transformative manner to transform chaos into order. Mm. Um, and Denethor wasn't either wasn't capable or wasn't willing, and so he was. So he wasn't a good leader. The city yeah. fell into. You know, so yeah. And he wasn't um, willing to see either. <laughs> well, he he was willing to see, but he wasn't actually willing to do anything about what he saw. <laughs> it was just like he he just wanted the knowledge, but he wasn't actually willing to do anything with it. Yeah. Uh, almost. So yeah. Um, and then obviously <laughs> Gandalf reminds him that authority is not given to him to deny the return of the king. And it's like, yeah, shut up. <laughs> I love that. Uh, it is a fantastic, and then he calls him steward, and he like yeah. emphasizes the word steward, doesn't he? And it is, it, it's almost <laughs> like he's just, it's the similar with Saruman, where it's like, oh, that really bite, like, oh, no, straight in the gut. Um, and you're just like, he just responds with the most, just sort of, where Theoden doesn't respond back to Saruman, 
uh, immediately Denethor responds back to Gandalf with Gondor is mine. <laughs> it's like as if a child is uh, is yeah. fighting with his father. Um, yeah, he's throwing a tantrum. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it does it does take almost Gandalf storming off doesn't exactly make Gandalf look any better. It looks very kind of sort of weak for Gandalf normally. I know it's like it's a, a winless battle in, in this sort of conversation. But at the same time, it's like, this is Gandalf. Like, why didn't you just like say something to him? But at the same time, you understand that Denethor is a, a man falling far into to, to despair that is unreachable, basically, uh, as we see with how he speaks to Faramir. Um, yeah, later on. Yeah. And for, from this, we basically see that the shadow of war is arriving in, in Gondor. We, we understand that this is... This is the final battlefield for, for where everything will happen. Well, um, I, I, I like the I like the when they leave the hall, um, the hall of kings, whatever it's called. Uh, they they take a walk out on the the big the big stone, you know, that sits out like a blade. They, they take a walk like right to the end. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, they do, don't they? Yeah. Gandalf's little monologue is like the it's about the the splendor that the city used to hold. Um, but it fell into disrepair because uh, its rulers um, counted the names of their sires greater than their than that of their sons, and so it's like they they just they they consider themselves to kind of be gods among men because of the ancestors they have, not because of who they actually were. Yes. Um, and so they didn't then pass on the idea of the splendor of Gondor to their sons and so then obviously you know it, it doesn't take you know a few generations of that and then all the original wisdom is lost and, and then that's that it makes sense doesn't it it makes sense why Denethor is so just sort of like this is all you know ownership of, of this place this is all mine there's no sort of appreciation for what he has around him mm -hmm. you can definitely see that mm -hmm. um and you see uh, little Pippin basically become in the service of the steward, which I think is fun because you get to see Faramir basically say that this is my uniform. Um, and that, he, that comes later, doesn't it? It does, yeah. No, I just I wanted to like link it first just because yeah, fair, fair. Um, it's really funny to see Pippin in this sort of scenario where he's um, he's he's become something other than a hobbit because this is the first time we ever see him become like almost like an adult because he's got like actual stuff to do in, in some way yeah. or another yeah. um, yeah. and yeah. we've we've gone from this scene where it's very serious like very sort of like the fate of gondor depends on this conversation um to you know pippin becoming a a, a sort of soldier which shows that someone who is basically up to this point a comical character becomes quite serious and it is this sort of transition that we're seeing in, in the film mm. um, but yeah like you said but there is a scene w that, that I have skipped over before we've uh, and that's the uh, extra scene which we don't see in the, the original film which is where um, Frodo and uh, Sam are going through old Gondor basically uh, the old outskirts uh, that's, yeah, yeah that's it I remember that so was that not in the original film though? No, no. It's um, an extra cut that they they uh, they've cut out because it didn't really add a lot to the story. Um, yeah, it, it was more. It was more just like a bit more symbolism, I suppose, wasn't it? Wasn't yes, it? exactly. Um, I, did, I did like that the because they passed by the statue of the king. Uh, yes. And its head has been replaced with like a big stone boulder with like yes. a, an iron helmet on it. Um, which like it shows you the the level of disrespect that the the orcs have for the world of men. Yeah, you know, it's like a, a great thing in you know time gone by, and it's like oh well, who cares? Who cares who he was? <laughs> um, but I did then. I, I actually can't remember if that's how the scene starts. Um, but I I I like when they walk past the king's head, um, and it's obviously got the weeds sort of wrapped around his crown, uh, and the sun shines through, and you see. I think it might be King's Foil, you know, that, that Yes, plant that, yeah, the uh, plant, yeah. Um, I, 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 and, and then you see he's got the, you know, the king has a golden crown. Um, but then the, site, the, the sun goes behind the clouds again. Um, 
and it and it's there's this idea that or it, it seems to be that it's like the the crown is naturally there um, but if you think about it like the crown is only reflecting the light of the sun the sun is actually still there it's just behind the clouds yes so it's like it's like the the king does have a crown a genuine crown um, it's just that you could kind of say remember what it always look like yeah um, and as I think the the light the uh, that poem all that's gold doesn't have glitter comes to mind there yeah because um, it's like the, the king still does have a crown and he is a golden crown and, yeah, yeah. You, you and me got a, d- a very different sort of view on that scene. I, I didn't see that at all. I, I, I focused on um, Sam, basically his, his words of, of sort of optimism towards the king, basically bringing the sunlight into the scene. His optimism, his positivity, his shine on, on the scene is that he is um, what is keeping Frodo there and therefore keeping Frodo alive and, and, and his physical ability to basically have the environment around him change is, is the in, in this scene he still has that effect um, and much later down this movie we see that it, it's slowly taken away from him because of the environment the, the darker the place is the less effect Sam has on Frodo um, but I do get what you're saying that's very interesting to see yeah, it's like Sam, Sam, is, Sam is also a little ray of light yes yeah that's what well, I, I, I know it's corny but I liked it I, I, yeah. did, I did think that was fun um, mm. and that, I, although it was cut from the film, I still think that film did have uh, that scene had something to give, even if it was cut. But again, yeah, it was already a four-hour-long film, and uh, you can't exactly uh, cut that anymore than you already do. Um, and we have the nice. So I, I've spoken about the service of the steward with uh, Pippin, which is the immediate scene after that. Um, and I love the scene where Gandalf and Pippin are stood together on the sort of in back, sort of apartment area at the top and they're staring into sh- into the shadow um that is mordor um and pippin says it's so quiet um and breath, gandalf yeah. responds with the yeah 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 exactly the, the deep beneath before the plunge and it is I love that. It's so important to think that this is the the silent moment before we see just hell is unleashed. And I've said that multiple times within this podcast, but this is truly hell. Like this is like yeah. the worst thing that could possibly happen to man happens. Uh, yeah. and we see just like a, a bucket of darkness just be chucked across the floor. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah, like throwing a, a bucket of oil. Yes, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this yeah, is I it. Li- I like, I like that. It, that it's, it's again, it's Gandalf narrating for the viewer. It's like that it's, it's giving us sort of the, an image of uh, what's what's really happening. The, the board is set, and the people are moving. Yes, like this, like it started. This is it. It's, it's that's that's here. a really good way of putting it. It is a chess board, isn't it? In some way or another. And uh, at the moment, Mond- Mordor is, has some sort of advantage over over the uh, city of Gondor. Mm-hmm. Um, and as well as Gandalf narrating, he also states that is you know you have that sort of interaction between him and Pippin. Is there any hope? And it, it, just a fool or so. Mm-hmm. And I love yeah. that because it's just so like yes, this is it. It's the hobbits are fools, and therefore it's the hobbits who are the hope for. Um, Gandalf as well as us it's not just you know Gandalf is is saving the you know the hobbits for himself because he sees them as the greatest hope for mankind as well as uh, as well as everyone else and I love mm. that line because it's uh, mm. it's it's making a joke but it's also so much just sort of hope in that one sentence in that one line um, I don't know if you saw that as much as I did but oh, I yeah, enjoyed yeah. yeah definitely just just a full hope yeah I mean it, it, it kind of I think it shows Pippin that Gandalf is, you know, he's the man with the plan, but like it's it's the best effort. <laughs> so that's that's all they could they could ever be. That's that's a really good point. Yeah, the be- the best plan he could possibly have come up with. This is this is it. This is the uh, what you'd uh, class as just the last throw, the the last ability to to, to do anything. Mm. Um, I'll, the next uh, bit we see, and this just is connecting. Oh yeah, go 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 go! Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just need to run to the toilet. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just uh, we'll just click on pause and uh, back in a second. Sweet, send that. 
And we're back. And we're just at the scene of the Witch King of Angmar. Uh, and this is the best imagery of a bad guy being introduced probably I've seen so far. I know we've seen him before in the first film. It's not nearly as cool having the helmet on, let's be honest. Like the, the, the silver sort of just like, I don't know what to, what to call it. It's like a gauntlet shape, like witch's chin, <laughs> some sort of thing. I don't know. I mean, in, in the in the book, it's described as a crown. Uh, okay. It's thing. described as a, an evil crown, for that matter. Yeah, <laughs> but it, and, and it, yeah and it, it floats on a headless torso. So it's like, it's the crown is here, but obviously you can't see the body. Oh, that's so cool. So, yeah, uh, that's a great description in, in, mm. in the sense, because when we see him in the film, it's just like a hooded... Um, creature of some sort. Uh, ironically, there's a character very similar to him in the Muppets Christmas Carol, who I'm mentioning now because it's so like it scared me to death as a kid then, and it scares me to death now just thinking about it. <laughs> having the Witch King of Anmar in a children's film. Anyway, um, <laughs> I love the introduction of the Witch King because it's you know Sauron's greatest sort of weapon basically uh, and we do see that in in this sense um yeah, i don't know like, if you've got any information no, no, on the book yeah. on him at all uh in, in what sense in yeah. in the sense that is there a description that that bases uh, other that it better than the film provides because i feel visually it's it's quite um i wouldn't say I, I i don't have a description of what the book provides i do have a passage that i was that i wanted to read yeah um, do it yeah yeah the the problem the the thing is it doesn't appear until later on. I, I'm okay. not sure we'll get to it in this podcast, but we'll, I'll definitely read it in the next one. No worries. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. But his his kingdom, his uh, kingdom, the city of dead. It's uh, it's it's just it, it just looks. I, when I was playing the Lord of the Rings: The Battle for Middle Earth two, the the game, the you you get to to sort of navigate the city, and it is just like. There's nothing there. It's just crumbling sort of stone on yeah. the inside. But the tower, the green tower is constantly burning. And oh, I'm cool. always fascinated by what is that? Is it flame? Is it like sorcery? What, what What's going on there? I suppose you, you can imagine that it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, if you imagine Anduril or Excalibur is like a symbol of a beacon of light. Yes. The, the the hero wields in a sense. That would the the light shooting up from the tower of, of Minas Morgul, that's like the opposite of that. It's like the the beacon of light for all the agents of darkness, something like that. Because it's not a pure white light, it's this green kind of sickly, deathly, uh, ghost like, you know, city as you say, like this this desolate, barren place. But everyone has got a rally to it. Um, and then also the legions, as as Frodo and Sam there, the legions of darkness spew forth, um, and and they're kind of they're following the they they are following their highest ideal in a sense. Yes, like is is the the polar opposite of Gandalf, um, because the uh, uh, obviously Gandalf are white and the the ring race are completely black, uh, completely dark. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's in, interesting. In it's, it, I'm glad you said he's a, a polar opposite. And um, I've got another question here written down: Is why is Frodo drawn to that city? I think you know. I, I think the well, I think the ring is drawn to it, and so yeah. the um, not, well, not only that, but also the the stab wound that the witch king gave him on the weathertop that would have some kind of pull, I guess. Um, yes. But yeah, it's, it's, it, the ring. The ring is because I, I think they in in the book they describe it. Obviously, it's, it's in the two towers um, when they're here at this point. Uh, as in when Frodo and Sam are at this point, not... not. Anyway, um, and, and they describe it as it's like they're, the air is thick, in a sense, with something that they, they don't like, and it like gives them headaches, um, and it kind of puts them in like a dreamlike state. So they're almost like they're, they're drunk and they're walking through. Uh, and then, obviously, the, the city is powerfully magic in a sense yes. so it's like you know, attracting evil and, and so yeah 
yeah, evil attracting evil, that sort of compelling magnetic force that, as you've yeah. described in the air, is, is yeah. there. Um, and this sort of, I love that description of uh, the desolate kingdom is represented in, in Gandalf sees this ginormous green light uh, and we, we get like little flashes between the scenes of what Sam and Frodo see and, and what Gandalf and Pippin see. Uh, and it's, uh, get, I love the, the sort of, there's almost a safety with Pippin and Gandalf in the sense that they're, they're far away from this, you know, this awful evil, but they can see it. They can see it from afar. But Frodo's so close to the, to the darkness. It's like this, it, he's the true, you know, the main character because he's so close within the depths of, you know, he's entered hell and hell's mm. about to visit. <laughs> you know the uh, the guys in 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 Gondor, the the, the hell is coming to them instead of he them having to go to hell. Uh, it's intriguing to see. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think it's because of the line, uh, "The great battle of our time," comes to mind mm. in the sense that they're that, that, that they're coming to them, and and this is where the the battle will be fought on on the plains of. Uh, I think it's yeah, on the, the Palenor fields. I, I, I Palenor suppose fields, it. Yeah. That the if Frodo didn't have Sam and Smeagol at the time, there would probably wouldn't have been a battle because yes. the Witch King would have taken the ring um, from that Sauron, and they probably would have caused the invasion because Sauron could then you know he could probably lead the company. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't need a lieutenant when you've got the captain ready to go. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or they would all or they would all be there. And, yeah. yeah. Sauron with the nine with his entire army, and then it pretty, would just be a slaughter. <laughs> yeah, it'd be pretty pretty hopeless. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I don't yeah. think even Aragorn can fight against that, even if he can take on entire <laughs> just sort of flanks of orc. Um, yeah, this is this is uh, tough times to see because you've also got Sam being very hard on. Smeagol and, and stuff like that and we've, we've got this whole dynamic going on between switching between storylines here um, and we've also got at the same time as this is going on the fall of Asgiliath going on at the same sort of within this same time period really, yeah. yeah so a lot yeah. is happening it's really tough to, to sort of keep up with it with it all but I think it's brilliant because the more that's happening the more I'm engaged in the in the film I don't know about you, but I just feel that I'm like, oh, that's going on. That's going on. Oh, that, that, that's happening at the same time. And so it's, uh, I think that Peter Jackson's really kick, kicked in. And when we see um, the Osgiliath battle, we're just, this is the, like the first introduction to the, to the invasion. Um, and we yeah, get introduced and it, and to the... kind of in secret again, isn't it? Exactly. The, the, the introduction of the, the captain of the orcs, who's just pure, unadulterated evil. Uh, he <laughs> yeah. is just disgusting, to say the least, but uh, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, he must have had some, some kind of industrial accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he had to call some 0800 number and then never got his claim back afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, I love that that's done in the shadows, don't you? It's done done in the darkness. It's going from, from the mist and they're, they're on the water um, and they, they invade from, from the river. And it's, uh, yeah, because they thought they were going to come from the north. Yes. In, um, places. And then, yeah, and they're like, obviously all the, all the, the men, the, the soldiers of Gondor and the rangers and stuff, they're all just sort of hanging out. Yes. And then it's like, all of a sudden, the city is basically, it's basically already taken at this point. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of too late, really. For them, obviously, yeah, so yeah, because like, there, there's just no, they're not prepared in any way. Yeah. Um, and there's and, not enough men. Yeah, there's the, yeah, the army is, yeah, the, the army is too great for them. Um, mm. But Faramir, we see Faramir show bravery again. We, we see him, like, even though the, the battle is almost already lost, he's like fighting and he's already saying, we've got to at least resist this. Um, and we see this element of, of Boromir in Faramir as well. Since, uh, definitely, definitely. And, and certainly because he, he's, um, he stands with his other rangers. They stand at like the doorway to when, where all the orcs come through. And obviously he lets a couple through because you kind of need to let your men 
deal with what happened. But then it's up to him to hold back the storm. And so he's he's got to be like the the bottleneck. And so he's got to like let he's got to let some through because he can't fight everybody. Yes. He's also got to not let too many through. And so it's like it's all on him. <laughs> uh, and and it, and he and he succeeds. You know, in, in in a sense, obviously, because they, they they do have to leave, but he doesn't die. Uh, so he is he obviously is a really good warrior. Yeah, exactly. Probably, probably equal to that of his brother. Yeah. And it's it's important to say that because let's be honest, Osgiliath isn't exactly an easy place to defend. Like there's it's just just a fallen city with like holes in it and rivers yeah. and so many ports of attack basically. So you know you got to be fair to him in, in, in this point. Um, I don't know whether I've skipped a scene here or not because I feel like I'm, I'm about to skip to the lighting of the beacons. What do you do? You have anything before that that you want to tackle at all? Uh, no, I think that is, I'm trying to, I, I can't remember the exact order, but yeah, the mm. beacons are, I'm pretty certain the beacons thing that is the, the next. Yes. Um, and cool. whenever someone says that, I immediately think, the beacons are lit, Gondor calls for aid. Um, and it's so much fun uh, for, for me to <laughs> constantly say that. Um, but the, the, I've got written here, they're the representation of hope. Uh, the, the beacons and I do like that they're lit by Pippin and Gandalf because they're they are part of the the, the army of hope basically um, yeah yeah and uh, they they represent that sort of Rohan Gondor connection they're trying to link the two together they're trying to to, to create that sort of mm. bond even if Denethor is willing to tear the entire place to, to, to shreds um, yeah, because he wasn't even really willing to light the beacons, was he? He wasn't. No, he said he yeah. said that why should we ask for help? Basically, just like Theoden did, mm. uh, and uh, it's funny because I say that now, but Theoden now shows his true colours in this mm. scene. It's like we've been questioning up to this point whether he can truly be a man. Can he truly show who he is? Yeah, um, and is, is he really the king that, that Rohan deserves, or is yeah. it that the kingdom needs or deserves, whatever? Yeah, I do like it. I, I like to see in in the book the, the beacons are being lit as Pippin and Gandalf ride into Minas Tirith. Oh, I, right. I think it's I think it's slightly more powerful, certainly visually, as they you know the the helicopter or the drone or whatever flying over the mountains. And you see these um, lamp like lanterns. How they did that, I have no have that, idea. You have that epic music as well. It's that, that's a good shot. Yeah, and then obviously Aragorn spotting it and running in with beacons lit, blah blah blah. And I, I like it, it's a it's a good. Um, I, I don't know, maybe maybe it's, maybe it's a bit simplistic, but it's like it's like almost a good bit of acting because it's yeah. like Theoden, like he's he's really weighing it up because he knows that not only is going to war mean that a lot of people are going to die, um, him included, he might die as well. Um, They've also actually got to go to war, mm. like that. That in itself is a big, a great effort. And then you've got to do all the fighting. And it's like, all right, yeah, um, Rohan will answer, so we'll, yes. we'll, we'll ride to their aid, and, and that's that. And then you have that the the moment he says that you have the horns blowing and you have the music, uh, and it's like, yeah, he's a king, cool. Like, there's no, there's, there's kind of no more doubt. Anymore. Yes. Exactly. Like after he, that, yeah. he is actually he is willing to ride out into battle rather than wait for it to come to his doorstep. Um, yeah, it's a good. Good moment. It is, and he shows and and uh, Mary. I've got written down it. Mary Adoc, uh, Rohan Esquire, uh, because he becomes that little man. It's 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 kind of funny because. I understand why they cut this scene now from the movie because it doesn't make sense. Why would Theoden like knight, you know, make him an esquire if he wasn't going to let him go into battle later on in the film? Uh, so I do understand. It doesn't really make sense. Like, why would you knight somebody and then like not let them fight? Uh, uh, but you know, it's just just a fun scene to see because it's like, oh, Merry's going to become an adult as well as Pippin. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then yeah, right into battle. And... Hopefully live. <laughs> uh, where the doom of our time will be decided, my friend. Uh, the doom of uh, our my time. battery is just running low. I'm just going to grab my charge. Yeah, no worries. I'll just pause it for a second. And we're back again. Um, we are talking about the 
ride from Osgiliath to uh, Minas Tirith, where Osgiliath has been lost, and you got the first wave of death. Basically, we haven't we haven't really seen a lot of death so far. Uh, we've only seen yeah. I think that am I right in saying that? Or if we this is the first battle we've seen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is like the first bit. Yeah. Um, and as you can see in the film, the Nazgul are absolutely tearing the riders apart. It's absolute pandemonium. Uh, <laughs> they are tactically like you know how Sauron has like nine riders, like nine ring wraiths. It's really unfair because like men don't have nine Gandalfs. They've just got one Gandalf. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's just unfair. Yeah, <laughs> and it is. And it is. I, I think that's why Gandalf rides out to save them. Um, yes. And, it, and, he, and he uses a bit of magic. Because he it, does, yeah. He's only allowed to use it um, when there's an unfair advantage, I think. And because obviously the ring race are... Like, I mean, firstly, there's no real, really attacking a dragon as it is. Yeah. Certainly not when it's, when it's being ridden by a ring race. And there's no, there's no way of killing them um, for ordinary men. So it's like, yeah, it's completely unfair. And they're running away. <laughs> It's like, like, how much more of a defeat do you want it to really be? Like, <laughs> can you not just let them run? Um, you, Denethor's already... like, just sat there in his chair, just like, I don't think we should have lost it so easily, should we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as if, as if it was easily given up. Yeah. But yeah, I love that you've got Gandalf, the white rider, you know, the light. I love the, the white light that comes out of his staff, and it's like yeah. the changing music, where you've got the sort of I want to say vocal, is it choir? Yeah, choir in the background. It's, it's almost like um, a sort of white vocal scenario where it's just harmony. Um, mm. And it's, it's the, the sound that gets the ring race to disappear, basically, which is kind of interesting to think what, you know, what Gandalf was doing with his staff. What sort of light was that? Was that some magic? Mm. But, yeah. And then from there we get Faramir recognising Pippin as a hobbit basically mm. and we see for the first time that Gandalf understands that Frodo's okay like mm. to, up, up to this point we've not actually understood that Frodo could be anything, he'd be dead, he yeah. could be like anything in a, in a ditch and, uh, Yeah, because it was, I think you said not, not two weeks past was it? Yeah Or, or was it like or six days or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something, like, something like that He was alive at least a week ago Yeah like like, So there, there was still definitely some hope there how much, obviously, who knows, but like I said, just a fool's hope. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. But Far Faramir, in my opinion, like he saves a load of men at this point in the film. You know, you look at that amount of people and you look at like the tactical misjudgment that holding on to us Gilead was in the, in the sense that it just was, yeah, it was just waiting to happen, basically. Mm. And yeah, Denethor definitely. is just, where Faramir shows true strength, Denethor just shows true weakness in the sense that he's just like, we shouldn't have lost the thing your brother has fought so hard to obtain. Um, and as you said within the previous sort of podcast, we've, we've got this lovely scene where we can remember Boromir obtaining the throne. And yeah, it'd be a city of beauty and of music. Yes, exactly. And, and obviously the, 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 when, it, when it sort of gets overrun, it's like all all of that is just going to be lost because they, those the orcs don't worship anything beautiful. They, no. you know, it's just horror. Um, I, I got it. Written, I got written down that it's the, the city of beauty is overrun by devil worshippers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's so true. It's just the, the satanists have arrived. They're ready to plunder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally, yeah. Yeah, and they're just, they're just going to take everything they can and it's just going to be destroyed and there'll be nothing, yeah. there'll be nothing good about it that's left. It'll just be just horror. And, you know. Yeah, no, it, it does 100%. And uh, the, the horrible beheaded men we see later on in the, the film being thrown at the walls of, of Minister represent that, I think, in, in many yeah. more shape and form. Um, and I'm, I think I'm... No, I'm not missing anything yet. But... Uh, Denethor, I've got, yeah, Denethor misjudges Faramir in the sense that he thinks that Faramir's basically, that was a massive defeat and 
that he shouldn't have lost it so easily. But the truth is, is that that was going to happen because Os- Osgiliath is overrun with thousands and thousands yeah. of orcs. That's yeah. just madness. Um, but we start to see Denethor's like madness sort of really start to, to creep in here. Um, and then we cut again to the climbing of the stair. I don't just really have a lot that. written here. Just, just, uh, just back on that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Denethor is, is he's, he's chastising Faramir for saving loads of people. Yeah, I know. It's madness, like, isn't it? He lost. Right, yeah. Um, but I, I like, so he says, uh, Denethor tries to, well, I don't know if he tries, but he, he sort of insults Faramir by saying, uh, ever you wish to appear lordly like the kings of old. Which I really like. Because he does have a, an air of, you know, of uh, kingship about him, I suppose. Um, and there, there's a little passage in the in the, the book that um, Pippin thinks when he, he's looking at Faramir and he's hearing him speak. So I'll, I'll just read it very quickly. Yeah. So this is the impression that Pippin has of Faramir. Here was one with an air of high nobility, such as Aragorn at times revealed. Less high, perhaps, yet also less incalculable and remote. One of the kings of men, born into a later time, but touched with the wisdom and sadness of the Eldar race. He knew now why Beragon spoke his name with love, who was a captain that men would follow, and that he would follow even under the shadow of the black wings. Um, and so it's like the men that Faramir is in, in command of, they look to him like he is Boromir, like he is, he is every bit a man, every bit a great man that Boromir was. Mm. Yeah, I, I thought that was quite good. It is. And it, it, it's hard to man. get that across to the viewer, isn't it? That Faramir is, is the man that Boromir was and, and, and that his father just can't see it. But I yeah. don't know if it's this scene or a scene later on in the film where we see um, Denethor mistakenly see Boromir come back in like a shadowy form behind Faramir. And it's like, yeah, my was, son, uh, he's come back. I, th- I think that, that's the, the next scene. Actually. Yeah. Because there's the because there's another one where you gotta get the, the betrayal of Smeagol. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, yeah. That's Smeagol, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And it's it's like a Faramir and the Suicide Squad. I've got written down it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Yeah. Uh, um, but I I love that you've uh, talked about how he's uh, by his men. Like, it's, it's not just, like, Gandalf and Pippin aren't the only ones who see Faramir as this strong character. It's us, the viewer, and then also we have, in the book, we've also got his men showing that he um, they understand him as the leader, basically. Mm. Yeah. yeah, captain, yeah. Um, but for, for the uh, next bits, I don't have a lot written down for the climbing of the stair and Faramir and Pippin talking. So if you've got anything that, that, that you've... Uh, yeah, a, a, a little bit. So Smeagol throws away the elvish bread. Um, uh, I do have something for that. Smeagol plays a good game of misinformation and fake news. Donald Trump. Eh? <laughs> 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 this, this video is going to be flagged now. Just <laughs> it is. It's just, it's just going, going to be, be taken going down. To be down um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, the, the, way, the way I kind of picture Lembas bread is it's like... Um, there's a line in the Lord's Prayer which is, give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Um, and there's also another line in the Gospel of Thomas which is, uh, man does not live by bread alone. And so there's, there's a bit of a dichotomy there. And I think what, what it means, or what it means in the Lord's Prayer, um, is spiritual bread is, is sustenance. Um, it isn't necessarily physical sustenance that you need to live a life like um, and the, the Lemba spread is like continuous daily reminder of uh, you know, the divine divinity and the beauty of, of life, so to speak. But obviously, the hobbits are basically sneaking into hell. Um, and so they, they can't see, they, there is no beauty in front of them. There's nothing that looks nice in front of them. So they, they like, it's easy to forget that, that, that there is real beauty. And so the bread is like the connection to what there is. But then Smeagol throws it all away. Uh, it does. And then, it's, and then it's like it's a, it's a full, it's like a hammer blow um, that like 
they the hobbits are in hell itself and there's no so there's, there's no good there's no light in there um so i, I found it quite interesting because <laughs> it's quite clever with smeagol because all he does is just sow the seed and then it's frodo and sam that, that where the real damage is done what happens is sam says the bread's gone blah 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 and then says he must have taken it and it's like he he passed the first stone almost and smeagol doesn't he doesn't even acknowledge that sam is even there he just looks straight at frodo and he says i don't eat it and frodo's like yeah you don't eat it and it's like the truth like he doesn't explicitly say he didn't throw it away um but at the same time he's like he's still manipulative it's like yeah yeah, yeah 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 exactly um, and then and then and then he tells the lie and says i've seen him he's always stuffing his face when he's doing it watching and it's like like that that's the <laughs> that's, that's pure, not pure only stuff. have you called him a filthy fat hobbit you've also just like <laughs> sewed his fate just by telling him that yeah, yeah. And, and like you turn two two best friends against each other basically yes um, and so yeah so then sam um is banished essentially um and he is sam is like truly in hell then because obviously Fro yeah. frodo is kind of sam's ideal as well he really yeah yeah of him. Um, and so like your your ideal is said to you that you're not good enough you need to leave that would hurt a lot it would um, yeah obviously it doesn't happen in the in the book um, but I do like, I do like the way it was done in the film. I thought it was quite clever. It certainly later on, obviously, when Sam realizes the, the treachery and climbs back up the stair, it kind of speaks to Sam's character um, that he was willing to forgive Frodo, um, regardless of the outcome and what actually happened. Because, yeah, I, I think it true heroism. There would be an, an element of forgiveness in there. Um, there's a theme there isn't there in the sense that we see in this film is that forgiveness is part of being a hero mm -hmm. it's re really important i think that's something that very few films sort of highlight is that sometimes you do have to forgive and move on to be able to become the hero of the story yeah definitely, definitely. yeah so yeah so then we're we're back uh, in gondor aren't we yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that to me is uh, you've you've basically got a lot more written down there for <laughs> for that part of uh, the scene because I didn't have a lot. I just had written down. Uh, yeah, God, I'm just spreading a load of fake news. Um, but yeah, Mo moving on to Faramir and the Suicide Squad. Um, so before, so before we see him talking to Denethor. No, he uh, talks he, to Pippin, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Pippin, yeah. yeah. And, it, and like you see in his you know, new uniform and stuff, and Pippin is sort of realizing the weight of his responsibility and so on and so forth. And Faramir says um, something which I really like, which I haven't actually got written down here. Um, but I, I, I noticed it like in a previous rewatch, like I mean, a year, last year or whatever. He says that no, no good deed should be checked with cold counsel. Um, Ooh. And there's a bit of foreshadowing because if you remember when. Pippin comes down to grab Gandalf mm. um, because Denethor sent him out to fight. Yes. And Gandalf says, this is no place for a hobbit. And then he saves his life. And then Pippin saves Gandalf. Do you remember that bit? Yeah. Um, Gandalf then says, guard of the citadel indeed. Like, he's giving him warm. He clothes. does, yes. Um, yes, he does, yeah. And it's like, it's, it's, it's not cold counsel. It's, it's, it's a good deed, and it's checked with, with warm counsel. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's because Gandalf's an actually nice person. If it was Denethor there, he'd have been like, "You should have done that anyway." Like yeah, you're exactly. part, yeah. part of my. Uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. And, that and makes also, a lot of sense, doesn't it? With uh, Faramir, yeah. and you know, he would do good acts, but the cold counsel would come from his father. Exactly. Yeah, and and he and it's like he he has the he has these ideas of nobility and what what nobility should be. He, he can't separate. I don't know. I don't know how highly he thinks of his dad, um, mm. but I, I think he thinks quite highly of him. And it's only when he says in the next, the next scene that uh, you wish now that I had gone, or that I had died and gone, and he lived. And it's like he, he suddenly realizes that his dad is not a, a decent person at all. He's like he is, he is a total prick. <laughs> um, and he eats like a pig in this scene. 
<laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, he's he's. Yeah, well, he's, we're not going to get into that. That's a whole different podcast altogether. How to <laughs> eat properly. Um, <laughs> Riding out to certain death is more courageous than any battle yet. That's what I've got to render. I think that what Faramir does here is not only solidify who he is as a character in this film, he also solidifies what we should all strive to be in the sense that even if he is striving towards certain defeat, he strives in a way that shows others around him the, the true courage to be able to do so and that it's yeah, a choice. Like doing it properly as well, not, mm-hmm. not doing it, not shooting. Or, you know. I, I like that he obviously... Um, Boromir, we obviously know Boromir held the city of Gondor in, in his high regard, uh, and Faramir, you can tell Faramir does as well, because when Gandalf is pleading with him to, to not go, uh, that you know, your father's will is turned in that he says this is the city of the men of Numenor, yes. um, I, I was glad he did my life for you too. Yes. But it, that's a, it's a beautiful sentiment. The it city is. Of, the city of the men of Numenor. It's yes. like, it's there's splendor and grandeur in that. And, and that scene alone, what you're describing, that where they're walking through the city and flowers are being given to them, that, that sort of resonates with what you're saying as well, because it is this beauty, this love for the, their soldiers. They truly care, the citizens, uh, about what happens mm-hmm. to them. Um, it's very in, in, you know, and it, impactful. And it's, uh, and it's obviously everything that the, the uh, city represents, it's the, the kingdom of the dominion of man. Yeah. Um, I've got it written down. So Faramir is the good prince that would regenerate the kingdom, um, but due to the old king being blind, the, the old king being gentle, uh, due to the old king being blind and old, it's going to fall to ruin. Um, and so that's why people are like laying out flowers as the soldiers go down, because they know they're all going to die. Um, but it's like they've got, because it's like they've got duty in that they have to do it. Um, so, you imagine like, the, the kind of man. Going back to what Pippin thought about Faramir earlier, uh, just, he was a captain that men would follow, that he would follow, even under the shadow of the black wings. Um, and it's like the the men, they obviously know they're going to die, but they're going to follow Faramir into darkness anyway, because he is Faramir, because he is a great, a, truly a great man. So, yeah, like it's. That. It's really not, mate. You don't make me tear up on this podcast. It's not what I'm about, okay? Um, but yeah, that's it's. It, not only is it sad, it's also just like Faramir's gave up everything. And I think you put it best. There is that he was willing to do that, and he wasn't forced to do it. Like he could have easily yeah. just said to his father, "Like, no, I'm not doing this. This is madness." But as you said, like, I would gladly give my life. Like gladly, like he he's there not only for honor, he's there doing it because he knows that um, he has to he has to do it for his his own sake as well as his men's um, in that sense. Yeah, but, yeah. And and Gandalf is sad because um, Faramir dying. Yeah, it, it's in a sense the the prince is dead, so the, the old kingdom is is completely gone. So it's like Faramir dying is is actually the end of Minas Tirith. You see, don't you see Gandalf like hunched over with his staff and he's like yeah. in a dark place just looking at the ground. It's like, oh my God, even yeah. Gandalf's like, whoa, that's, that's, this is seriously bad because if Gandalf yeah. is questioning like life at the moment in, in that moment, then this is, this is the end basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah if the, the greatest in Gondor is, is going to be told to throw their life away so easily, it's like, well, like there isn't much hope left. Um, obviously, Aragorn kind of carries the, the, the rest of the hope, but like it is, as, as far as Gandalf knows, that, that isn't necessarily going to come to pass. Um, yeah. But he, he knows that Faramir is definitely going to die. So, so yeah, it's quite sad. <laughs> it is, man. It is. And w- while this is all happening, Pippin's singing to Denethor while he eats badly. Um, and uh, while the. The eating's not great. The song itself is brilliant because it really does sort of resemble that horrible death, that like, oh, miss behind. And it's like, he just says the world, doesn't he? And it's like, mm. it's that shadow that falls upon the light of the world. And it's, it really does yeah. sort of create that scene in the sense mm. that we're watching people go to their death. Um, mm. And as they ride into battle, 
uh, and you see the archers preparing to shoot them and it's it's like the end of the song is like that heart stopping of the men it's uh like you said it's just a all round extremely sad scene <laughs> yeah. uh, moving on anyway uh i've got quite a lot written for the next two sections you'll be happy to know that the next two sections are rohan rohan gathering and the demult road so they're quite both very significant in this part of the film. They are near the end, but they have a lot to say. And with Rohan gathering in the mountains, I'm not sure where specifically. I don't know if you do, you, you know. There, there is, it, it does actually have a name and it is like the gathering place for mm. the Rohirrim. Um, but I, yeah, I can't remember what it's called now. Yeah, it's, it's not a big deal, but the, uh, um, I remember Thayer and say within like the first he was like uh, where are the snowborns they didn't come my king and I was like damn snowborns like, <laughs> you had one job um, but 6,000 6,000 against what was it like even Saruman was able to muster 10,000 wasn't he mm. 10,000 Urukai and you realise that the Rohirrim are only able to muster 6,000 um, yeah, well, he says it, it's less than half of what he would hope for. Yeah. I, I, I saw, a, just to change the title a little bit, I saw a meme recently. Uh, <laughs> which was, it was basically uh, Thayer and Aragorn looking out, and he says, 6,000 spears, that's less than half of what I hoped for. And then Aragorn says, I found these two spears. And then he says, and then Thayer and says, 6,002 spears. <laughs> more than half of what I was hoping for. <laughs> but anyway, that's not... <laughs> I just thought it was one of those silly little jokes. I thought it was quite funny. Oh, you're bringing the dad jokes to this podcast. That's exactly <laughs> the sort of humour we want here. That's exactly it. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, <laughs> so the, the, bad. Oh, the, dear. The, the location they're in, it's like they're... Because they're obviously gearing up and ready for war. They're ready for battle. They're, they're, they're standing... All, all the men are in like the, the field below and the king and the king's company are standing where they should be, which is like right on the line um, between the, the chaos of the underworld and they're sort of the, the barrier between the underworld and the rest of the men. Because obviously you have the dim old road in the past yes. of the dead and so on. Yeah. So, yeah, they've yeah. got the shadow of the mountain over them. They've got that, yeah. like you've you've put it best. It's a barrier, isn't it, between the the, the living and the dead? Yeah. Um, and it's it's the dawn of Aragorn's fate, isn't it? It is this sort of piece in the movie where we're seeing that 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 there's lots of different routes people are taking throughout this film. There's lots of different characters taking different roads, um, and the Dimult Road is the one that Aragorn has to take down. Um, yeah. And he and he catches it before he knows he has to go down there. Um, he catches a glimpse into it and he actually sees the sort of the shadow thing. Yeah. And it's like he sees a glimpse of his deeper self, of his deeper self and his deeper shadow. Um, and so it's, it's another moment when his psyche is put into turmoil again. And then obviously later on, or the, the very next scene, I think, he has a dream about Arwen again. Yes. And so it's like he's, he's looking, at, looking at his shadow um, and psyche... His, his psyche explodes with, I don't know what to do, and then an animal figure appears and he gives him some sense of direction. And it is, it, uh, I do like that you've p pointed that out because Arwen's death is like a, it's quite relevant to the fact that he's next to like the place where <laughs> these traitors go for for death and it's this yeah. underworld and this, she, he's, he's dreaming and he pulls out his knife, doesn't he? It's like, it was so real yeah. that he, yeah. he was about to attack somebody out of it. Um, the guy who comes into the tent was so chill. He was just like, I've seen this before. Like, do people <laughs> pulling out knives on other people? Uh, but yeah, we, we've it, one thing that one scene I found kind of interesting is that Aramir says to, to Eowyn, War is the province of men. Um, and it's it was intri intriguing to me because in this film, it's actually not men who who fight the biggest battles, it seems. They fight the, the wars, but they don't fight the biggest battles in the sense of mm. what wins the overall war. And yeah, so yeah. It's, it, it was intriguing to see that, although Aim is a really wise character in, in these films, and he, he, he's normally the person who sees through the, the, the lies of like Grim Grimma Wormtongue, or he sees that he can you know, support his king, so on and so forth. It, it was kind of you know, typical 
sort of shallow statement to make that war is the province of men. But he's also trying to save his, his sister from seeing the darkest part of, of the world, yeah. basically. So you understand yeah, where he's coming from. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because it would be it would be a horrible to have to ride into battle. Like you ma- imagine, certainly, like I mean, it'd be bad enough with guns now. Um, you know, like like World War One and Two would have been bad enough. But like you have to you have to come into physical contact with another man who's trying to kill you. You're you know a piece of metal trying to trying to hack you to pieces. It'd be absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Um, because it wouldn't. It wouldn't take much for you to die. Yeah. Uh, or no, no, sorry. It wouldn't take much for you to be completely incapacitated. You might not die for a little while. So you might get, you know, you might be slashed in the leg and have all of the, the meat of your quad cut through. And then you just fall down. But you're not dead. Like, you're just in agony. And no dead. more squats for you. No, exactly. No more running, no more walking, no more, no nothing. Like, it would be, it would be absolutely, it would be absolutely terrifying. It's true. No, I, I make a joke out of it, but it is the most. That part of war is is worse than what I see with like with guns. At least if you get shot in the head, you get shot in the head, you die, sort of thing. Yeah. But with like metal, like spears and and mm. knives and and blades, like sometimes you just will be there for hours, dying, or or in the worst case scenario, suffocating because you're surrounded by so many men that you can't breathe, basically. Yeah, like like in uh, Game of Thrones. Exactly. Like, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I prefer to use the king as an example, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but uh, the shadow, is, yes. So Aragorn sees Arwen's death. Yeah, that's awful. And then Elrond turns up out of nowhere. And uh, I know that's not in the book, but this is nonetheless. It's in- intriguing. Well, it's uh, yeah. So just, so just before that, I, I, I put the, those who dwell in the mountain, the lost souls, need to be united by the King of Gondor. Uh, and this can only be done by the person who is the rightful heir to the Shard of Narsil. You know. Okay. Hold, holding, holding the sword, um, the flame of the West, and the yes. flame, the flame of the West is like it's like the light of consciousness. Yes. And so what needs to happen is Aragorn needs to take the light of consciousness into the darkest, deepest depths of himself. Yeah. And revivify everything and bring it all out, and then it's like there's no more shadow anymore. Yeah. It's like he is wholly within. And they'll yeah, answer yeah. to the King of Gondor. I love that line where Elrond says to Aragorn, they answer to no one. And it's like, they'll answer to the King of Gondor. And he just pulls out the, the flame. And it is, that's, it, it, there's a lot of um, sort of pride I feel for both Aragorn and El- Elrond in that scene. Because like you say, it's it's making the traitors, the, the those who, who have failed in life, they're, they're redeemable, basically. This is the sword that will redeem these men. They will yeah. be taken from the unconscious and given a second chance. And yeah. again, this theme of forgiveness, we're showing it more. I think J.R. Tolkien had a thing where he was like, ah, oh, we're going to have to show the world the better because living through World War One probably made him think, ah, oh, I can forgive the Germans, therefore I shall forgive everyone, basically. Um, which is, you know, you, it's very difficult to do and I can't imagine oh, yeah. it's easy yeah. to, to do. And sometimes you want to hold on to a grudge. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's certainly like with the case of, of World War One. Um, I mean, it's a war that we we never really should have got involved with anyway. But yeah. the it was sold to the people who signed up. You know, like everyone over the age of fourteen basically went off to war, uh, and they were basically sold on the idea that the Germans were, you know, putting babies on bayonets and using them to fight and stuff, and like they were just horrible people and like. And, and they got there and they realized they actually weren't. They, they were just, you know, in, in innocent men caught up in someone else's battle. Um, and yeah, it's like that, that would have, I, I think Tolkien being rather intelligent, he would have known that. But it's not, evil itself is not something that you can just, it's not like there aren't many people who are wholly evil. Mm. Most people are made up of, you know, good and bad and you have to forgive the bad part because they're also in the same. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, I think it's almost like um, Elrond's giving hope, hope mm-hmm. to men. And we've talked about forgiveness. And, and again, World War One, World War Two, 
there was not a lot of hope <laughs> in those wars. Um, and, and you've got to think, like, with World War One and II, as you've highlighted, the opposite side were made to look, you know, by using sort of propaganda and so like that, that like, like they were beyond evil. They were, you know, unredeemable. But we're, in Lord of the Rings, we're physically dealing with unredeemable beings <laughs> in, like, orcs yeah. and sort of Sauron. They are literally pure beings of, of, of evil uh, who have been corrupted and, and cannot come back from that. So it is really intriguing to sort of see that this is like so far right that we've, we're never going to see this ever again. Um, but it's intriguing to see that uh, Elrond was willing to basically say, right, even though I know that this is the end for all of you, here's the, the last hope that I'm going to give you. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's like, it's the, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's like the, a reminder of the, the light of consciousness or, or something like that. But Elrond was the, it's very yeah. true. Yeah, the light of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I wrote on the sword of the Lendil um, with regard to Aragorn. He needs to become fully conscious in order to become a true man. And the only way to do this is to go down into the underworld and, <clears throat> and assimilate the darkness without succumbing to it. This includes recognizing and perhaps forgiving the cowardice and dishonor of other men. Um, and if you remember in the first film, Aragorn says that he has the same weakness. Um, yes. As a silver, the same blood runs in my veins, he says. And Arwen says to him, you will face the same evil and you will defeat it. Um, and I think it's like that, the, the dream he had is like another one of those moments. It's like, you actually are the best man that there is, like, in the world, so to speak. And that's why I'm willing to give up my immortality for you. I'm willing to... And, but you have to recognise that as well, and I, and I, I think that <clears throat> maybe not, maybe not when he's given the sword, or maybe not when he goes in. I think it's probably when he comes out of the party of the dead, and the king says we fight, that he then realises, okay, I'm actually the king now. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's, although they, they don't make a big a big moment of that. No, they don't. But I think that's good. You don't need to. There was, there's this sort of like, Aragorn was always meant to be the king, and he was always meant to redeem him, like not redeem, but achieve this rank and achieve this ability. Uh, he yeah. just needed to walk that road. He just needed to follow that line, um, which is very difficult to do. It's not like he's like going into some candy land, like cloudy sort of like s s sweets and lollipops sort of land. He's going into the dead. He's going yeah. into somewhere like that is just horrible um but i do love that uh uh gimli and uh, legolas you know add some humor to the scene where they're just like have you not learnt anything of the stubbornness of dwarfs and they, they come along anyway even though they know they're going into a place where they probably could die basically mm. um, and well, I, I had a i had a thought on this I, I forget um we mentioned it earlier on um, yes it was like you were talking about um uh, the emotions of, of, of complete man and so on and so forth. I actually think that Aragorn, the King Aragorn, is such a complex character that he wasn't, you couldn't really show him in one man. Uh, uh -huh. so I, think, I think his character is actually the three hunters. It's Gimli, Legolas and Aragorn. And so the, I, I could be totally wrong here. Um, but what I what I kind of see, at least in the films, is that Legolas is like the the sort of the lover archetype. Um, yes. And he sort of he sort of it's a man that is you know he likes poetry and flowers and nature and he can see the beauty and blah 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 blah. And Gimli is like the warrior. He's like this the hard tough you know basically lives underground. Like he loves a good fight like beer <laughs> um, and then Aragorn at the moment is like he's like the magician archetype he's like the professional he's trying to assimilate the, the pieces of his being um, and he's trying to do it through speech and through fighting and blah 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 and that the three of them entering the path of the dead with holding the sword uh, you know the light of consciousness it's like he had to be all of those things to then become the king. Yes. Um, if, if you, yeah.
That's brilliant, mate. That's a really good way of that because it makes sense because you're right. You can't have one character who embodies all parts of this sort of personality. Um, and that each of them, as you've pointed out, are so in depth. You can't like have one person who has every single piece of that. I think that you've pointed out Legolas really is. He's part, he, he's like the woodland elves. They're part of nature. It's almost like they're going to fall back and fall asleep into the, into the wood that they are born into and so it's, it's this sort of connection and like you say like you know Gimli and Aragorn speak for themselves and who they are as, as, as both warriors and, and magicians because there's a lot of times when Aragorn is sort of he contemplates doesn't he he doesn't just fight or speak he speaks when he needs to speak and he speaks when he thinks it's important and um, yeah and then when when he does speak what he says is is meaningful exactly yeah. So, so I tell you what, that's something that I constantly, truly try to 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 move forward to is meaning, and I, I'm hoping that these podcasts uh, are trying to show that is that we are looking for meaning in, in things that we that we want to see. Um, nonetheless, um, I do like the next the, the scene that this is. So before Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas head into the Demont Road, you've got the Rohirrim gathered together basically, and as they're going away, they see. They say, oh, they're going because it's hopeless, because there's like it's all over, that we're all going to die. And Theoden comes in, he says, yes, it is hopeless, but we will fight nonetheless. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know how to express it any other way. Like, it's, it's just it's, like... It's like uh, in, in the film 300, I, th I think I mentioned this in the, in the previous one, um, the, the Spartans are looking out onto this field of like a million soldiers that are all going to stampede towards it. Um, and one of them says that I hope that out there there is a warrior that is great, that is great enough to give me a glorious death. And it's like to, to die in battle, um, I think, I, I, I maybe should look into this actually in, in terms of like the, in, in the book. In, in the books, um, or like the appendices or whatever, of the history of, of, of Rohan. Um, but it could be that they're, the way they get to uh, the halls of the afterlife of their, their ancestors is by dying in battle. Um, and there's a lot of societies, I think especially the Viking societies, uh, they believe that to die in battle gave them kind of the right to get to the afterlife. Mm. Um, and so I think that's what Fairly is kind of hoping for. Um, but, yeah. Something like that. But yeah, I, but I, it, it does resemble that Viking esque sort of lifestyle, doesn't it? The Ro Rohirrim, especially, um, you know, they live on their horses. They they don't have they live in wooden houses. They don't live in glorious places like the, the Gondorian. So it's, it's it's a very Viking sort of scenario. So I totally get that. Yeah. yeah so. Um, do you have anything before, else for, for that? Uh, yeah, I was about to say, do you have anything so, else for that area? <laughs> um, before they go into the, before they take the, the Dimmock Road, yes. uh, Eowyn and Arwen, uh, and Eowyn and Aragorn have a last little encounter. They do. And he basically, he basically tells her that he can't be with her, <laughs> uh, and it pretty much breaks her heart. But it's, it's not unreasonable because she she's like if you imagine Eowyn is like the ultimate representation of a mortal woman. Yes. Because she she is she's beautiful and she's got you know whatever blonde hair and whatever. Um, so it's like she she would be you know a shield maiden of Rohan. She would be like if you were to marry her, she would be the best one to marry. Because she's yes. Like, she's the best one. Um, but <laughs> for Aragorn, she's not good enough. <laughs> Almost. It's so he stupid, isn't it? Oh, he, God. he obviously he obviously doesn't say that. No. Um, he he does he does say that it was it was nothing more than a shadow and a and a dream. Um, so yeah. But he, he it's it's also a good scene because it's because Aragorn's half immortal as well because he's a man of the old kingdom. He's a man of men, and so it does make sense why he falls for a, a being who is also immortal, uh, like Arwen. And it does make sense that, like, she she is like you say the the perfect depiction of a mortal woman. But Aragorn isn't, and therefore he's he'd be fighting against a person who he isn't. And you, the yeah. whole point of Aragorn is being someone who he should be. Mm. Um, 
and 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 being the like you say the king that he, he should and contemplating as the magician so now 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 we have the demult road after all of this um and i love that by the way what we've just gone through there was so much to go through that there is uh there's always context but the, you know we did the best we could <laughs> um how, how much more out of curiosity how much more do we have to go before we because we're, we're aiming for about halfway uh yeah so so we we um we are literally at the last two sections. So we have the Demont Road and Gondor is under attack, and that's it. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. And then that's the end of part one, um, which is insane because we are two hours and 38 minutes into this, and there's so much we've covered, and there's so much more to cover within the next. So uh, let's yeah, let's crack on with this last little chunk. Cool. Um, so you've we, we've been talking about Demot Road. This is the most significant thing I think in this part of the movie. Um, it is Aragorn's traversal of the underworld, and it is also his, um, like you say, I, I don't think anyone could put it better than how you put it with the the sword, the flame of the West, enlightening those of the dark. And uh, yeah, it's it's really hard to to put anything else on top of that, if I'm honest, Ali. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> But it, it's like the, the descent into the underworld. This is like the, the most difficult one Aragorn has really had to do. This is like um, Aragorn's own adventure into his own version of Mordor, which I've yeah. said in the, in the previous, um, previous podcast. And, it, and it's like it's, it's, his, it's his toughest battle in a sense because it's against himself, it's not yes. against like external beings, and it's against the absolute worst parts of himself. Um, and yeah, and, and to, to go into it voluntarily with the, the sword of Elendil, like it's it would take some it would take some force <laughs> to do that. Um, Certainly would. But I I like the so when when they when they're going through the the stone uh, mountain path, whatever, um, and they get to the door, and it's like everything is like dead around it basically, and you have this inscription that Legolas reads, and he says the way is shut. And it, it was made by those who are dead and the dead people. And it's like I like I like the the idea um, because the there, there's a saying that I, I forget who said it. Um, it may have been someone like Isaac Newton or whatever, but he said that if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and if you imagine that everything. Everything that we inhabit right now, um, it was basically built by people who are dead. Um, and so Jordan Peterson says it's something like we, we, we live on the bones of you know, the, our ancestors or something like that. And it's basically that these, these men were once part of the world, uh, but now they've died and they're going to, you know, they're in the underworld. And they are rigidly holding on to what they have, um, and so nothing new can come from it because the dead are keeping it. Yes. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if that's a very well articulated point or not, but I, the other thing I've written down is that everything we now have, sorry, <clears throat> everything we have now was built on the bones of those who came before us. Um, all of human history is a bloodbath, and we have to recognise the good that has come of the bad. And we must be grateful where we uh, where we come from. And it's like these men were supposed to fight, but they didn't. They ran. Uh, yes. Maybe they did fight at some point. But <clears throat> I don't know. May, maybe I'm just belabouring a point here. Um, no, it's yeah. important to say, mate, because the from from what you're saying as well, it's uh, these guys held on to the world the the treasures the the things that don't really mean anything it's almost like we're going yeah. back to that um, egyptian way where they the pharaohs got buried with all of their gold and their silver yeah. um and they yeah. thought that it would be with them in the afterlife and these guys are, are clinging on to that now mm. um, if that's the point you're trying to make i don't know interpretation yeah, it certainly, it certainly, certainly is, is part of it yeah it's like they're, they're, they're clinging on um to whatever life they still have um Despite the fact that letting go of it would be the much, much less painful way of going about things. Yes. Um, but then, so obviously they're going, they're walking through, and um, 
Yeah, so, so they're, they're obviously walking through and we spoke in the last podcast about how elves are able to see um, in... I oh, know no, we spoke about it earlier. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think we, we also mentioned it in the previous one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That el- elves can see more than, than mortals. Can exactly. See. Um, and their Legolas is saying that they're, you know, I see dead men, dead faces and spears and swords and stuff. Uh, and then he says they're rallying. Uh, so they're obviously going to where their, their king is. Um, and in the, the little conversation that, they, that Aragorn has with the, the king of the dead, um, if you imagine the king of the dead to be the ultimate representation of all of these cowards and so on and so forth, but he's still tough, like he's still hard. So he's willing to just kill him <laughs> and that's that. But he has the light of consciousness, so, so he's okay with it. But he says, the dead do not suffer the living to pass. Yes. Um, and I think that may, maybe it means that there, there is more power in death than there is in life or something. Because I suppose that like death is kind of the norm. You know, life is kind of, life is not very stable. Like you can die pretty easily. Uh, I don't know. I don't know maybe, maybe I'm just it's chaotic, it. mate. Yeah. But it is. Um, but, but he will suffer Aragorn. Mm. Um, because Aragorn's spirit is made of, you know, it, it's like Aragorn is the right element of what a man should be if he's going to be king. Yes. Uh, and so he will uh, submit to him, in a sense. Yeah, because he's the king of the dead. He's the king of all the worst things, and therefore the only thing that can kill the king of the dead of all of the thieves and traitors is the king who is of the good and is of yeah. the men, that of all of the qualities the king of the dead doesn't have. Um, and I do love that, that you, you said that the dead do not suffer the living to pass. To pass. It's because most of the living are still a part traitor, still part, you know, they still have that weakness in them. But Aragorn, he is that light. He carries that, the, the best parts of man, even if he is willing to admit that he is part of the, the worst parts of man as well. I yeah. think that. Well, he's, he's also willing to carry the worst parts of, of, of yes. men, um, but may, maybe not let it, maybe not let them make the decision. To make yes, it, still, still listen to them. He he does remind me of Hades, doesn't doesn't he? This 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 guy is like the Hades Lord of the Dead in the sense that he's in the under he's physically in the underworld. He's surrounded by dead souls, uh, and even though he's a god, he's just sort of there's no. There's nothing positive. It's all just death, death, death all yeah, the time. He's still, he's still in hell, isn't he? Yeah, there's no yeah. like positivity coming out of it. Mm. Um, and, yeah, <laughs> and then imagine the, how brave you would have to be to stand <laughs> yes. an army of ghosts <laughs> with your sword out. So, like, you're, you're almost challenging them. It's like, like, like do, does anyone actually want it? And then you look at the king and it's like, do you want it? And then the king, like, they, they, they are actually willing to fight, so the king would just lose. It's, yeah, like, it's yeah. crazy because he's <laughs> just like, it, it, not just uh, serious bravery, it's also the fact that Aragorn is on his, you know, there's three men. It's not like it's an even fight. Even if you brought an army into that mountain, it's not like there's any sort of way of defeating an army of ghosts yeah, in yeah, any way, shape, yeah. or form. But yeah, <laughs> madness. Um, and he does, like, Aragorn's offering hope to souls who've been damned for so long that they probably look at Aragorn and think, well, you know, you're lying, or there's no way that you could provide us with this hope that you're talking about. Um, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Because in the extended edition, you see that they have to escape the cave, don't they? They have to like like all of the places crumbling because of the skulls. Yeah. And stuff. So I, I I thought about that. I think it, it crumbles around them in a sense because the energy that was holding the place together was the hatred of, or maybe not hatred, it was, but it was the spirit of the dead. Yeah. Right. And now they have accepted that they can leave. Uh, the, the place is just going to crumble because there's nothing, there's no more strength keeping it up. Because there, there is, there was obviously strength in them, mm. uh, and in whatever, whatever personality traits they were kind of representing, there was a lot of strength there. But when they physically left the place, the, the strength went, and it was because it was carried with Aragorn, then, I suppose. So then he, he had to get out, had to escape. It is, yeah, that's a really good way of putting it because that makes sense is that 
all of these guys were holding it together through their pure will of of being yeah. dead ghosts. So yeah, that's the best way of putting it. And did you, did you did you see the scene where you f- fully see like Aragorn's just like he he look he thinks he's lost. He thinks he's yeah. failed everybody. And it's like Viggo Mortensen's acting in the sense that like you just see this man. He just looks like he's lost everything. Um, and it's oh, I just. I know there's no like you can't analyze that, but the, the just the pure ability to do that is is impressive. <sighs> um, yeah, he's a, a, yeah, he, he's a good actor. But um, on on top of that, you see the the Ghost King come out of the wall, which is just like I oh, yes, accept. And uh, you see the the ships, the pirate ships, and uh, I think that's the last the last shot of that sort of section of the fi- of of that film. But uh, yeah, we don't we don't see them again until basically towards the end of the Battle of the Palermo. Yes, so, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and, and then we just immediately hit um, Gondor is under attack now. Uh, and Faramir arrives from the brink of death, um, which is really interesting to see this, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I had a thought on this. So we've obviously said numerous times that the mightiest man may be felled by one arrow. And was yes. Yeah. So was Faramir. He was, Faramir yeah, by by two arrows, and so that so it, it's almost like that, like one extra arrow would have killed him. <laughs> like, and it, and it, just like, that it one. Yeah, well, it, well, cause it took three arrows to kill Boromir, didn't it? Yes. And so it's like it's the same. He's the same guy, basically. Maybe not quite as tough as, as Boromir, but he's still like like close. Now he got shot yeah. with two arrows, and he was the only one to come back. Yes. So like he definitely is tough. Um, so, yeah. No, so, no, it's, it's great. No, I, I think that's really well put, and I think that I didn't even think of that genuinely. I just thought, oh, he's returned. There you go. This is sort of yeah. great. But uh, the one one thing I did pick up on the next bit is uh, fear is what that army is. Is the, the the army of the orcs like they're not just like the darkness. They they just bring fear to to the man to mankind. And uh, where they throw the decapitated heads into the city, they bring more fear. And it's like this ability to, to scare human beings is, is also a weapon um, because mm. you've got like the Nazgul cry, you've got the, the head speed thrown, you've got like the, the red shields with the, the eye of Sauron on them. Just uh, it, it's, it's interesting just because I think that, that that plays a big factor on how the orcs have won because they're not exactly like they're not built like men they're not as tall as men um but they are sort of the the reason why they are victorious in some battles is because they have the fear on their side and they have the ability to, to mass yeah definitely it's like it's, it's savagery isn't it they to, uh, sort of yeah into. yeah did you um I, I doubt you've seen the the film but there was a i want to say very early on Joss Whedon film uh, where it was based in space basically uh, I think the film was called Serenity and within there there was these um, cannibal uh, sort of humanoid people and that basically all, all they had to do was uh, have these ships go past and you could hear the screams of those unfortunate enough to be encountered by these cannibal people oh, right. um, and it was this uh, idea of like these ships alone the, the the mere sight of them would make any person like nearly die from fear because it was just so because of like the shapes and the colors put on the ship as well the representations of... yeah cool. sorry I, I, I didn't mean to diverge into a separate oh, film yeah, but yeah, you know yeah. um I've got written down here. Denethor offers ruin and death with his uh, famous line that uh, he shouts. <laughs> I, I suppose. I mean, that's it because he's like because he, he says my line has ended. Yes. Like, the, like his his blindness and his unwillingness to do any to take any action has caused the death of his son, basically. Yes. And so then he's lost all hope. And yeah. He he he's kind of confused himself with like the spirit of the leader you know and so he basically yeah screams at his men flee for your life <laughs> like, like it's not i mean even <laughs> even even if you are going to die like you don't want to die running away do you? no no exactly and uh, you have to see the the wise magician that is gandalf 
come in and say, prepare for battle. This is yeah. not what you're doing for me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's brilliant. And uh, it's, it's almost like everybody all at once realizes like, ah, we probably should be fighting right now and that our entire city is going to fall apart if we don't do something. Um, but Denethor does represent like that sort of weakness in men where you can just like sort of give up and just say, I don't care anymore, you know. Um, I yeah, don't know. Let, let it all fall to shit. And, yes. Yeah. Um, wizard, yeah, wizard of strategy as well, because he's like organizing the men to uh, fight against these giant like towers. Um, and he's like, aim for the trolls. And I was like, oh, that's, that's, yeah. How, is he, how does he know this, number one? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, we saw this in the first film where he kills a troll. So that makes oh, yeah. sense. So Gandalf it, it, knows okay. how to do it. It, it, it also kind of makes sense. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't shoot a load of arrows at just a solid iron block, would you? you and yet they are. <laughs> I, I, just, I, I can't help but feel like, I can't help but feel like they, they missed out on... You know, like a hundred first meters. year training. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's like don't don't shoot uh, the the thing that's solid. Don't shoot where it's soft. Yes. But anyway, whatever. Yeah, no, no, I know what you mean, but it's, it is rather funny seeing that where they're just shooting at solid uh, rock. And uh, mm -hmm. you've also got the scene where the uh, Captain Orc, the, you have this giant boulder come at him and he just spits on it. He just steps <laughs> aside. It's just so funny. This is brilliant. Um, but apart from that, I've got the wolf head uh, heads appears. Um, I was wondering if you have anything for that section at all. Um, we, I do. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think. So we're not up to that point yet, though, are we? Is uh, is there oh, a scene? Have I missed a scene at all? I mean, I mean, there's obviously the the catapults and yes. you know, the, the sort of the what do you call it? The to and fro, the yeah. fighting because obviously Gondor has trebuchets and stuff, and then all the Nazgul fly in and destroy all the trebuchets. Yes. Um, and it's like, you know, spreading fear everywhere. Yes. Um, what else do we have? Is, is that the scene? So in that scene, is that the one where Mer it, where Pippin comes out and says they sent us out to fight? Or is that before? Yeah, I think so. That's yeah, it. It's, it's, I thought I missed I, something. I it might be that he does that. He comes down to fight, saves Gandalf, and then he goes back up. And then they appear. That's um, it. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of the the order of events because I know that. So they they obviously can't breach the. the yeah, that's yeah. rather funny because they're like they're piling up, aren't they? There's like quite a lot of orcs. Like you're like, whoa, like, like this is an effective. Front. Yeah, this is an effective front door. My goodness. Yeah. yeah. But I love it that the, the I think the captain's name is Gothmog. Okay, um, cool. Also the name of a, of a power rod, but we'll, we'll get to that. But he says, um, like, what are you doing, you useless scum? <laughs> and it's like, mate, they're doing their best. <laughs> it's like, it won't go down. <laughs> it's just yeah, like... You can't, nothing will breach it. Yeah. And, yeah, and obviously they look, they look to Grom to handle the underworld. Oh, I, I love the sort of chanting that goes on within that it just brings out something very like archaic in me where I'm just like, Oh, 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 Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, um, oh, dear. it's an interesting, I, I like the motif where it's basically wolf head. Yes. Uh, it's like it's on fire and it's massive and it like it's being pushed by trolls and stuff. Who's, whoever it. thought of that was just like, it feels like it's a teenage boy who's just like, he's going to be on fire, we're going to have him in a battle cage, he's just going to hit a wall. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just feels yeah. like somebody's coming to the design studio and said, we're going to have it like this. <laughs> oh, dear. Cle clever, clever way of doing it. I think they used a model, uh, like a scale model. Of it, like oh, wow. Model. I think that's how it, because they, they use a lot of models for the cities and stuff. They do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like with Helm's yeah. Deep, because it was yeah. like the same size as up to my knee, basically, in yeah. that reality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's cleverly done. Um, well, I mean, yeah, so so I the last thing I have, basically, is uh, uh, Grond is like this, it's like this dead machine that all of the orcs kind of worship, in a sense. Oh, I like, like that. When they're, when they're chanting Grom, um, mm. it's like there's, they're almost desperate for it. They're like looking at it as if it's like this, like, like, a, like a messiah of some sort. 
yeah. when it's just like a dead machine. Um, it's like all their all, all their hope is kind of in it somehow. It makes sense because you've got to remember that Sauron was like an empty casing. Like he was a spirit within like metal sort of like he was a machine himself in the sense that there wasn't anything inside the armor. It was just a spirit um, in the sense, in that same sense. So they do worship Sauron in, in, in the same sort of scenario. So that's in, intriguing to think about. I didn't think about that at all. So, yeah. Yeah. But then, but then the, the, are we are we into part two now? So so that that's the the last scene of part one is the wolf's head hitting the door and that's it. Right. Okay. Cool. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's that's the end of part one, guys. I know you're excited for part two as much as I am. We have just hit three hours. That was uh, another three hour podcast. Me and Ollie, as you can see, are extremely good at talking for long periods of time. <laughs> but. Again, once again, mate, always a pleasure having you on here. I love doing this. Um, we're going to continue to do this for a very long time. Uh, I hope, if, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely, yeah, definitely. But this has been a Taylor's Tales podcast. This is Chris's Corner. I'm your host, Chris Taylor. And uh, this has been Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, part one with Ollie Deacon. Thank you. And goodbye.